The Innkeeper by Life Sketcher Chapter 41 Tempest Lex lay on his bed trying to go to sleep, but his arms were in too much pain and kept him awake. He practiced a lot at the shooting range and his aim and accuracy improved considerably. The price, other than the actual price, was that all the muscles in his arms were incredibly sore and his joints hurt. He wanted to try and heal normally as he couldn't afford to pay an MP at the moment, especially since he had to upgrade the recovery room for Marlowe. Oh my beloved MP, where art thou? Lex whispered, clearly suffering from sleep deprivation. But his drowsy musings were cut short by Mary who appeared to tell him Marlowe had already completed the trial. It hadn't even been a full day. Lex jumped out of bed and prepared himself mentally to face the giant, but when he returned to the inn what greeted him was a very average-sized, unconscious man. Other than the fact that his height had been reduced to around six feet, yes, reduced, and his massive bulging fortress of a body had changed to a toned one, and that somehow the man's appearance was younger, Marlowe seemed fine. To be honest, those few changes themselves seemed so drastic that he would never have recognized him as Marlowe if the system didn't tell him. Externally he does not seem hurt, but internally his body seems to be digesting itself. He's in a state of severe energy exhaustion, you need to put him in a recovery pod immediately, said Mary, seeming alarmed. Lex didn't waste any time and spent 1000 MP to upgrade the recovery room and sent Marlowe to the recovery pod, which cost him another 150 MP. He was left with only 291 MP, the lowest he'd ever had. But he couldn't focus on that for now, ultimately this would be worth it in the long term. After ensuring that the giant was safely put into the recovery pod and that it was working, Lex turned his attention to what he had gained from the trial. The conditions for the trial were 10,000 Tier 1, 1,000 Tier 2, 100 Tier 3 and 10 Tier 4 zombie cores which Marlowe had successfully submitted, but along with that the man had also submitted a Tier 5 zombie core. That was a level above Marlowe's own cultivation, it was incredible. Lex wondered how he had done it. Unfortunately, Lex could not keep the Tier 5 core, as he would need to provide Marlow with a likewise additional reward but at the moment he had nothing to give. When Marlow woke up, he would return the core to him. For now he entered the gift shop and placed one of each core on the shelf and priced them. Using these cores helped body cultivators further their cultivation without any negative effects. Tier 1 cores helped body tempering, and Lex priced them at 200 MP Tier 2 helped Qi tempering, which he priced at 500 MP. Tier 3 helped Foundation which he priced at 1500 MP and Tier 4 helped Golden Bones which he priced at 5000 MP. He only needed to sell a few of these and we would already be in profit. Now all he had to do was wait for more guests. There were a few keys in circulation now, not to mention the chance of random people encountering doors. Hopefully he would receive some guests soon as he could no longer afford any more upgrades or expenses. With that done he returned to Earth and tried to sleep, eventually succeeding. He spent the following day surfing the Bluebird portal. His arms hurt too much to practice shooting so he thought he'd acquaint himself more with the cultivation world. He made an account on Tempest, the Twitter equivalent of the cultivation world, and browsed to see what was happening in the world. The most common thing he saw was fights and tournaments between Qi training cultivators. Most recently a family had resurged in India, claiming to be descendants of ancient Mughal kings. After they had lost some wars that nearly drove their family to extinction they had escaped into a hidden minor realm they possessed. Minor realms were realms that existed like miniature worlds, isolated from the greater world around them. They only had a few entrances or exits, sometimes even only one, or none at all until the realm destabilized. After this family grew back in strength they returned to Earth, and since their return had sent their younger generation to participate in various chi training tournaments to collect resources. Over the past six months they had won every tournament they had entered, and had suddenly become a massive presence in the cultivation world. One such member of the younger generation from the Mogul family, named Bobber, was extremely active on Tempest and had a lot of popularity. But his sudden popularity had drawn a lot of negative attention, and had been challenged to a fight by a user called Russian Princess 77. When he arrived for the challenge, it turned out to be a trap and he was beaten mercilessly by Foundation Realm cultivators which had in turn fostered a lot of tension between all families that had lost something to the new Mogul family as no one can discover the identity of the attackers on their purpose. Since Bobber wasn't actually killed, the authorities weren't treating the matter too seriously. Many such dramatic incidents were taking place all over the world, and Lex found himself spending hours embroiled in the drama on Tempest. Something interesting he learned was that although there was a lot of fighting and competition, it was rare for any cultivator to die in cities. Most deaths seemed to be in remote places or in newly discovered minor realms. The few instances where deaths occurred in cities or towns, the organizations responsible for monitoring cultivator activity took swift and serious action. 
Apparently, if the number of unclosed cases ever exceeds 5% of registered cases the organization would be very seriously penalized. Lex found this slightly strange, he was all for increased security, but all these organizations seemed a little too desperate to maintain the peace on Earth, while on the Moon and Mars everyone was responsible for their own security. And who exactly would penalize an organization that failed to meet the mark? There were a lot of obvious holes in the information, but none of it mattered to Lex. He only needed to care about how to get more guests. Somehow getting a popular Tempest user as a guest might not be a bad idea. He just had to pick his target now. He followed a few celebrities so that he could stay up to date on what was happening. While he was randomly surfing, he found a Tempest account that he found shocking. It was the account for the owner of Fight Fortress, who turned out to be the wife of. Marlo is awake, Mary said, appearing before him. I think he broke his brain, he's just been laughing since he woke up. No no, that's how you know he's still normal, replied Lex as he closed the portal and prepared to meet his first ever trial taker. Author's note, two have's extra chapter you guys unlocked from last week. Chapter 42 Alexander the Great Alexander sat quietly in a boardroom, contemplating morosely the events that had occurred this past week. They were very unexpected, and greatly influenced his mood. He was a 17-year-old handsome young man, but his eyes and posture dictated power and composure uncommon among his peers. His life experiences were extremely unusual, to the point where he thought it was unlikely anyone had ever been through what he had. Born heir to one of the most, if not the most, powerful family in all the solar system he had been groomed from birth to be the best. A team of over 300 psychologists, biologists, cultivators, philosophers, historians and many more were brought together to design the most perfect upbringing to make him the most capable human to have ever lived. The plan had begun long before he was even conceived. Both his parents were brought to their optimal physical health before they conceived, and his mother was nourished and nurtured by the best spiritual herbs and medicine known to man while she carried him. His first five years he underwent training as well as observation, but not strictly. He was allowed to explore and grow as a normal child, but certain habits of hard work and thirst for excellence were nurtured. After he was five was when his real training began. The training was extremely careful, they did not want to influence his personality to become something specific, but while his interests and pursuits were in his own control he had to be taught certain skills and ways of thinking. He was made to face failure, again and again, in every field, and taught not to give up just because he failed. But that also did not mean he had to try and succeed endlessly like an idiot stuck on something. After each failure or success he had to analyze and understand what had happened, and determine the best path to either try again or grow in a different direction. At seven years his training became more strict and he had fewer freedoms. It was also the first time he was made to kill an animal. It was a sedated animal, and he had been taught the best and most effective way to kill it. He was left in a room with the animal unsupervised, and was told he could leave once he had done it. The room was not locked, and to be honest he did not feel too much pressure as he had always known it was coming. But he felt an unusual reluctance, one he could never fully understand. It was like he knew once he took this step, he would forever be on a path he could never return from. Nevertheless, he did not hesitate too long. He did the deed and left, moving on to his next training. A week later he was presented with another animal and told to kill it. This time there was no hesitation. From then on every week he would kill one animal, and they would eventually stop being sedated. When he was nine years old, there was a change. He was not told to kill an animal, instead he was dropped in the habitat of a young, wild animal, and told to survive for 30 minutes. By then he had already received combat training, and he killed the animal long before his 30 minutes were over. Yet he had to stay the complete 30 minutes. As humans could not begin cultivation until the age of 15 he did not face any spiritual beasts, but over the years he faced everything from wild dogs to ferocious bears. Eventually he reached a point in his skill and temperament that he no longer needed to kill the animals. When he would enter the habitat he would face off the animals, and more often than not the animals would recognize his strength, and bow down. When he left the habitat, the animal would still be alive, still wild and ferocious should anyone else enter but tame as a pet in front of Alexander. In his studies he was not expected to be the best in his class and receive only A's, he was only expected to understand the material well enough to be able to use it. To test this, every year he was given a certain amount of funds and told to start a new business based on what he had learned the previous year. This started when he was 10, and since then every single one of his ventures was a success. Some were better than others, but they were all profitable. He was taught how to socialize, with his elders as well as peers, and from different financial strengths and cultures. He was trained in the art of recruiting followers, in determining ulterior motives, in detecting threats and signs of friendships. 
His training became extremely difficult once he started cultivating, both mentally and physically. At that point, almost all freedom was stripped from him. He could only follow the training routine, with the freedom of only a single choice, the freedom to quit. At any point since he had started his training at the young age of five, he was told that he could quit whenever he wanted. If he quit he would be allowed to let go of all his training, and would be allowed to lead a normal life. But if he quit, although his position as his parents' eldest child would remain, he would lose the status of heir. What could the position of heir ever mean to a five-year-old? He would be rich even if he didn't have that status, and he would be loved with or without it, but for some reason he could never rationalize quitting. He didn't know what it meant, what it signified, or what the result would be, but it was the only expectation his family ever had from him and he would never let them down. Even when it hurt so much he secretly cried, even when he had to study alone while his peers played with one another, even when he faced death time and time again, he never quit. He lost many battles in life, lost in many ventures, lost in many of the risks he took, but among those his age he was always the best. Never, since even before the age of five, had he ever seen a peer in age as an actual challenge, those who could threaten him were older and more experienced. His peers were only ever followers or admirers, it was natural, it was a matter of fact. Until last week. When he started cultivating almost all his freedoms were taken from him, but he was also told their complete freedom would be given to him when he fulfilled one of two conditions, either he turned twenty years of age, or he entered the foundation realm. He could even determine whether or not to continue his training, as after that he would wield full authority over his own life. Unexpectedly to almost everyone, he had already entered the foundation realm at seventeen years old. In only two years of cultivating he had entered the foundation realm, something completely unprecedented in recorded history. But entering the foundation realm was not easy, he needed a specific opportunity, and that opportunity lay in a minor realm in Cairo. This minor realm was special, in that it opened once a decade and was treated as a training zone by a few academies and organizations for their cultivators. It was filled with ancient ruins and various spiritual beasts, and those that entered had to find their opportunities on their own. Alexander naturally gained permission to enter the minor zone through special channels, but whether he could gain the opportunity he seeked was up to his own skills. For Alexander this was not a problem at all as he was already at peak chi training and was especially skilled. Events played out as he expected, and all his challengers ultimately failed, allowing him to easily find the opportunity he was looking for, a special meditation chamber left behind by an ancient, unknown civilization. Every decade it allowed one person to enter, and allowed them to break through smoothly whatever realm they were in. Right before he entered the chamber, however, he was stopped by a mysterious woman. She was wearing a mask so he could not determine her identity, but he was certain that she was younger than him. He did not spite her for stopping him, the opportunity was for whomever could grasp it, and fought her fairly for the right to enter. What he was not expecting however was to lose. It was not that her techniques were better, or her equipment, or her cultivation. He was superior to her in all those things, but her judgment and battle effectiveness was beyond anything he had ever seen. She retaliated in ways he could not expect and was never caught off guard regardless of whatever he did. Her temperament and bearing were also extraordinary, something he had never seen in someone his age. If she was from a renowned or powerful background as he was, he definitely would have heard of her, but this woman was completely unheard of. Ultimately, he lost the fight. But before she could enter, he offered her a trade in exchange for letting him use the chamber. Once he broke through he would gain his freedom and have all the resources of his family under his control, so long term he could offer her a lot more benefits than the chamber they were competing for. After a bit of consideration, the woman asked for his contact information and then disappeared, allowing him to use the chamber. He used the chamber and broke through, but he had no time at all to enjoy his newfound freedom and power. He was too focused on the identity of the woman who defeated him. Once he left the minor realm he used all the power at his disposal to investigate all the people who entered the realm, but could not find anything on her. It was apparent that she had snuck into the realm somehow, an incredible feat as well. The mystery around her only increased, and Alexander grew even more curious. Finally he let out a deep sigh, and stopped thinking about it. He could only wait for her to contact him to learn more about her. Until then it was better to focus on things he could actually focus on. The first thing was to rein in his arrogance, he already thought that he treated every foe seriously, but his loss had made it evident to him that he never treated people his own age as a serious challenge and threat. This was a loophole in his mentality, and could be used against him by anyone who noticed the flaw. The second was to finally celebrate a bit. For the first time in his seventeen years he could do whatever he wanted. Send them in, he said over the intercom, and shortly after three teenagers burst into his room screaming. Alex I can't believe you did it, shouted the first boy, who was quite a bit taller than everyone else. 
Looking at his incredibly skinny figure you could not tell that he was a second-step chi training cultivator. Ha 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 do you know how much I bet that you'd break through before Henry, that old goat? I'm going to be rich. The boy laughed uproariously and excitedly, as if he could see his dreams coming true. Oh shut up Greg! shouted a girl, pushing him out of the way. She had long, black hair that fell all the way to her hips, and gorgeous black eyes. She was smiling softly as she looked at Alexander in admiration and worship. Congratulations Alex, you've worked hard. Her name was Helen and her cultivation was the highest in the room besides Alexander, at 7th Step Chi Training. Only a few weeks older than Alexander, she would be considered an unprecedented genius anywhere, but next to Alexander her brilliance was shadowed. We must celebrate. I've already booked us a shuttle, we can head for the moon in a couple of days. Haha, <laughs> with no one to watch over us anymore we can go crazy in New Las Vegas. The third teenager was a rather flamboyant young man with bright red hair and an orange tattoo of a flaming bird on his neck. His cultivation was the lowest, at only first step chi training, but considering his young age he could still be considered a genius. Shut up Zeus, no one is going to the moon, scolded Helen while she kicked the grinning boy directly out of the room. Her soft and gentle demeanor had vanished, and she looked angry and annoyed at the stupid boy. He only ever had dirty things on his mind, she could not allow Alexander's brilliance to be tainted by this aspiring hedonist. Forget them. Forget them. Update your level status on Tempest. I need proof or else that old dog will never pay his bet, said Greg, quickly running to Alexander with his phone out. Amused, Alexander acquiesced and logged onto Tempest with his phone and used a detection talisman to check his cultivation level, which then automatically updated his level and status on Tempest. Greg burst into another bout of laughter and quickly dialed his phone, waiting for Henry, his eldest brother, to pick up the phone. Helen is right, Zeus, I can't go to the moon just yet. But still, the event does call for celebration. Do you have any suggestions? There's an auction tonight near Tahrir Square, said Helen, not giving the others a chance to speak. You should go there to buy gifts for your parents and your teachers. After that, I heard that a restaurant called Cleopatra's Garden has a special dish they make from spiritual awakening beasts and they have live spirit music. That sounds great, commented Alexander, let's do that. Lex stood in front of Marlowe's recovery pod, slightly heartbroken. The man had woken up, but his recovery was ongoing. The way things were going, it seemed he would need to pay for another day of recovery for the giant, which would hurt his pockets. But he did not let that show. Even though Marlowe was awake, he was incredibly weak at the moment. Despite the recovery from a lot of his wounds, he had to use all his focus on taming his unstable bloodline, which was not a short process. So the recovery pod healed him while his own blood harmed him. Gradually his bloodline was stabilizing, indicating that he was heading towards the right direction, but it would take much longer than Lex had expected. I'm very surprised at how quickly you completed the trail. I'm even more surprised that you took down a tier 5 zombie, you must share the story of it when you recover, said Lex praisingly. Marlo smirked, but could not say anything. For now you can continue to rest. Once you've recovered, we can talk a bit. Believe me, you will be extremely satisfied with the state of your body once we're done with you. Marlo believed what the innkeeper told him, but for some strange reason he could not muster any excitement at the thought of his body recovering. He found his thoughts trailing back to the overwhelmingly strong woman he'd seen on the planet full of zombies. Before he fell back asleep, his last thought was that he wanted to fight her. How dare she say he was wasteful with his weapons? Chapter 43 Auction Lex stood silently, slightly unaccustomed to how normal Marlowe looked. The sleeping giant, no, the normal-sized man was very pale and to be honest did not look much better despite having been in the recovery pod for so long. He used the recovery room's special ability to look at his injuries. Name, Hanson Marlowe Bravi 3. Age, 67. Sex, male. Cultivation details. Spirit cultivation, golden core, crippled. Body cultivation, Golden Core Peak, Unique Cultivation. Species, Human Slash Prime Human. Bloodline, Evolving. Remarks, Extremely unstable energy has detected coursing through his body. Please treat him like a walking volcano. Conditions. Severe muscle atrophy. Severely damaged organs, all. Severely damaged meridians, all. Golden Core crippled. Body cultivation suppressed to foundation realm due to injuries. Blood extremely corrosive and volatile. Multiple bloodlines detected. Skeleton severely damaged. Brain function compromised. Trace tier 5 zombie mutagen. Traces of soul corruption. Traces of spirit corruption. Vitality severely compromised. Report. The primary source of the patient's injuries is the patient's own blood. The blood is forcefully being evolved by absorbing multiple superior bloodlines, which has caused severe damage throughout the body. 
The long duration of the process has severely overdrawn the cultivator's vitality and natural healing ability, greatly compromising the cultivator's lifespan. The evolving bloodline has further tried to absorb the zombie mutagen, an irreversible process that will either result in success or death. The patient's soul and spirit are also severely damaged, a result of overdrawing the strength of the golden core before it was crippled. Lex frowned, he hadn't realized that Marlowe had also been infected. Furthermore, according to his status, he would either absorb it or die. He wasn't worried about Marlowe becoming a zombie, if that were a possibility his status would have revealed it. What Lex was worried about was the fact that it was unlikely for him to heal completely in one, or even a few days. He thought of a solution, which was to use the golden ticket. He was sure he'd activate a new quest if he used it, but it had not yet been a week since he used his last one so he couldn't use it yet. The only alternatives he had was hope for another guest, or hope Hugo left his room and bought something from the gift shop. Lex didn't like leaving things to chance so he started thinking of a good excuse to get Hugo out of his room and into the gift shop. Alexander was sitting in a private room with Helen, Zeus and Greg at the auction house. His three friends were arguing amongst themselves, as they usually did, and he was working on a laptop. Although this was supposed to be a celebration, Alexander could not completely avoid some work. Naturally he had to report to his parents and elders, as well as begin preparations for a few projects he had planned. It might seem dull to others his age, but he liked the feeling of making progress. The auction had already started a while ago, but things that could attract the attention of the few in his private room would be at the end. Other than Alexander himself, the three in his room also had powerful backgrounds. They were friends he made in Troy Academy, the school he'd attended since he was young. Suffice to say, Troy Academy was one of the most, if not the most, popular academy on earth for cultivator families to send their kids to. For some it was a great opportunity to nurture their kids, but for people of Alexander's background the only purpose of attending the academy was to gain exposure and make connections with other families of strong background. Alexander's family was based on and controlled all of Mars as well as its moons, so he was quite popular at the academy even though he never attended full-time. Zeus' family founded New Las Vegas, a city on the moon based on gambling and luxuries that would be illegal on Earth, and to be able to maintain such a city his family was not lacking in strength either. Helen was an orphan raised by a prominent family in England. There was no sugarcoating it, Helen was raised and supported for the sole purpose for alliance by marriage which was the reason she was sent to the academy. If she could not attract someone influential herself, her family would take the matter in their own hands. Still, to be worthy of an alliance by marriage her status was not low and she had been exposed to the highest rungs of society. She didn't feel sorry for herself though, she understood that there was a price for everything she had received. Greg was from an ancient and large cultivation family, and it was impossible to say he was from anywhere specifically as his family was spread all over Earth as well as the Moon and Mars. Still, Alexander had not befriended these few because of their statuses as someone like him did not need to do that. He sincerely felt that these three were good friends of his. But if they felt the same way about him or were close to him for his status, he didn't think about it for now. Alexander's phone vibrated and when he checked he had received a strange text. Six Sword Slice, Meteor Launch, Dodge, Dodge, 33 Fists of Troy, Propulsion Grenade. For a second Alexander was confused until he quickly realized those were his first six moves when fighting the mysterious woman from the minor realm. It was a message from her. A few moments later, he received another text. Two keys will be auctioned soon. Give me one and we are even. Alexander let out an amused smile. He was impressed that she knew his location, as well as new additions to the auction list, because as far as he knew there were no keys to the list of items to be auctioned tonight. It showed her resourcefulness, but the fact that she could not get the keys herself also gave him a bit of information to speculate on. Then he received a third message, and while the smile on his face did not change, the look in his eyes became serious. I can handle it. Consider your task done. He replied. He looked out at the auctioneer, but at the moment they were auctioning a painting. Alexander had no interest in it. Score. Zeus suddenly yelled, looking at his phone. Suddenly he looked abashed as he realized he yelled out loud. Ahem, excuse me. I, uh, I have something to do, I'll be right back, he said, suddenly moving towards the door. What's her name? Helen asked in a ridiculing tone. Betty, Zeus replied without thinking, but suddenly realized his mistake. Hiding his embarrassment at getting caught, he strutted out the room as if he had nothing to hide. Helen let out a deriding snort and turned away, while Greg let out a chuckle. This was nothing new, as Zeus was always flirting and Helen was always looking down on him for it. An exchange like this had happened a million times, it was almost like a routine, but how could the small irregularities in it escape Alexander? 
Not only had his senses been elevated since his rise in cultivation, he had been paying attention to every action everyone in the room took even while he was working. The irregularity was not in Helen or Greg, but in Zeus who had flinched when Alexander received a text. It was a very small reaction that was suppressed almost immediately, but how could it escape Alexander Morrison? Helen, I have to step out for a bit. If they auction any keys while I'm gone, get all of them and charge them to the room. I'll take care of it later. All right, replied Helen in a gentle tone, smiling. Of the three friends, Alexander only ever asked her to do things and that always made her proud. She completely ignored the fact that of the three friends she was the only one who was even slightly responsible so he could only ever ask her. He stepped out of the room but Zeus had already disappeared, but Alexander could track him effortlessly. He walked calmly, as if he was in no hurry, for a couple of minutes before he found his way outside a different private room. Without any hesitation he broke the lock on the door with a piece of spirit tech he had and entered the sight of Zeus hurriedly setting up a formation. When Zeus saw Alexander he froze and his eyes filled with panic, but Alexander only looked back at him calmly. Alexander entered the room and closed the door. Silence filled the room for a few minutes as the two boys stared at each other, until Zeus' look finally changed from panic to defeat. Of course, how could you, the great Alexander Morrison, not already know everything? Was it fun, watching us mere mortals dancing about? Alexander didn't reply immediately, and stared at him for a while longer. Finally, he said, I thought we were friends. Friends? Do people like us have the luxury of having friends? Zeus said, and laughed despondently. He sat down on a chair, his shoulders sulked and his body reeking of depression, a stark contrast from his earlier demeanor and energy. Of course, when I say people like us that does not include you, Alexander. Your family loves you and is supporting you with everything they have. Who in the solar system doesn't know the name of Alexander Morrison, the golden child of destiny? But it's people like us, Helen, Greg and I, who are treated like we were born with a golden spoon in our mouths, but is that really the truth? Who doesn't know that Helen is being raised to marry off, that despite all her efforts and achievements, they only serve as embellishments to her worth as a wife? Who doesn't know that between his four brothers, and seventeen cousins, the only support Greg can get from his family is that of a prestigious name? Or me, Zeus' voice trailed off. At the moment, he did not look like a young heir to a large family and strong cultivator, he only looked like a defeated teenager who was in way over his head. Or me, he finally continued, whose greatest threat is not from the enemies of my family, but from my family itself? If I ever break into the Foundation Realm, I'll immediately become a threat to the old geezers in my family in the Golden Core Realm. They'll start considering the day I might break into the Golden Core, when they'll have to share their resources with me. The solar system is saturated with cultivators, there's too few resources to go around. There's barely enough to support the geezers in my family as it is, having to share more? They'll kill me. But I also can't not cultivate, because if I'm too weak that would harm the prestige of the family. Everything I do, I have to worry about whether I can live or not. Do you think that I have the luxury of making friends? Alexander looked at the person who he once thought was his friend, but there was no anger on his face. There was no pity either. So what is this then? After all these years, why are you taking action now? What is this? Zeus mimicked. Don't you already know? The moment you became a Foundation Realm cultivator, your family announced your status as the next head of the family. The solar system is rampant with rumors that the day you break into Golden Core your father will attempt breaking into, into the nascent realm. One family with two nascent realm cultivators? The solar system cannot afford such a force. If you're dead, your father will not be able to focus on his ascension, or will at least delay it. That's what those old geezers are after. And what was your role in this, Alexander asked, no longer hesitating with his questions. I was supposed to isolate you from the outside world. The formation is set and all signals were supposed to be cut, you weren't supposed to be able to message anyone or receive any messages. But the moment you received a text message I knew I had failed. So you were what, trying to renew the formation? What? Zeus asked, confused, then looked at the formation he was setting up and understood the confusion. No no, this is a mini-teleportation formation. I was escaping. I don't want to risk my life. When you received a text, I knew something was wrong. There's no way someone like you had no protection. Alexander looked at his once friend, and after a moment took out his phone and forwarded Zeus a message. Read it, Alexander said. Zeus took out his phone and when he saw the message his eyes widened in horror. Zeus, responsible for isolation formation. Helen, responsible for ten poisons of Ishkbal. Greg, host for Heart Meridian Mothergoo. They will act at different stages of the assassination attempt depending on the situation. The text Alexander had forwarded was a small part of the third message the mysterious girl had forwarded him. 
In the end she had also offered to help him out if he needed, in exchange for another favor of course. Alexander had turned down her help, although he did not know about the details, but he already anticipated the assassination attempt. If you already knew, why are you going along with it? You're putting yourself in danger for nothing. Not for nothing, Alexander said, looking the young boy in the eyes. After all these years, I wanted to know if you were really my friends. Alexander's words froze Zeus and shocked him as well. Alexander was not some naive, inexperienced young man. Zeus knew for a fact that Alexander himself had killed more people in his training than most could even imagine. A concept such as friendship should have been driven out of his mind years ago, he should have only had relationships for benefit. Of course, he would never portray himself as utilitarian, and would be generous in his actions, but he should not have associated with such childish concepts. And yet, here he was braving a threat to his life to get an answer he wanted. You can leave, Alexander said. What? You're letting me go? Zeus was shocked. He could not believe what he was hearing. Treat it as a gift, in exchange for all these years of accompanying me. Since you have not directly acted against me, I can let you go. When you return, tell your father he is being used like a puppet. Killing me to affect my father, that is just a stupid fairy tale. War on earth, and even on the moon, is impossible, even though that's what the people behind you want. Even if you succeeded in killing me, there would be no war. Instead, you all would be directly massacred. Honestly, these nouveau riches don't know anything. Zeus was still in shock, but since Alexander said he could go, Zeus did not suspect him. Under his supervision Zeus completed the formation and stood in it. Before he activated the formation, he left Alexander, the man who had once thought of him as a friend, a few words. The ten poisons of Ishkbal have been injected into Helen's blood. If she does not transfer the poison to someone else soon, she will die. With that the formation turned on and Zeus disappeared, leaving only Alexander in the room. When he heard about Helen there was a glint in Alexander's eyes, but his expression did not change. No one could tell what he was thinking. Chapter 44A Play Chapter 44A Play Alexander Morrison, confirmed heir of the Morrison family, the golden child of destiny, the youngest foundation realm cultivator in the recorded history of Earth, walked back into his private booth as casually as he left. By looking at his expression no one would be able to guess he had just confronted one of his oldest friends for participating in an assassination attempt against him. You would also not be able to tell that he had casually let him leave, and continued to pretend as if he knew nothing. One must realize that if Zeus wanted to betray Alexander, the moment he escaped he could let the other assassins know that Alexander was already aware of the planned assassination. But he didn't consider it a big deal. To be honest, even before he received a text message from the mysterious girl warning him, he already knew that there would likely be some attempt on his life today. In fact it would be more apt to say this opportunity for an assassination attempt had been specifically engineered by him and his teachers, and took years of planning. Due to his status he was always followed by a protective entourage and his itinerary was always secret. The only foreseeable event in his life where he could potentially have lacked security was during an occasion where he lowered his guard. The moment he broke through the foundation realm and left the security of his family and academy seemed like such an opportunity. During the years leading up to his breakthrough, he coincidentally mentioned in front of a few groups of people that when he broke through he would arrange for a shuffle in his protective detail because he wanted to choose his bodyguards himself rather than the ones his family gave him. He also let his friends know when he was planning on breaking through, which should have otherwise been a huge secret no one could have discovered. The reason for all this was simple, he really wanted to know who was truly loyal to him and who was only putting up a front. To be honest, knowing or not knowing didn't really matter as he fully understood the concepts of searching for benefits and competition for resources. The people he could completely trust was predetermined from birth, so whether the others in his life took the chance to participate in this assassination or not would not change that. But Alexander wanted to do it anyway. He was treating it as an experiment, as well as a learning experience. He had always treated everyone with sincerity. A part of him wanted to know if sincerity and loyalty really affected his relationships, or was the world as cutthroat as it seemed? It could be said that the outcome of this evening would greatly determine the future actions and decisions of this destiny's golden child. There were no keys auctioned, Helen told warmly, looking at Alexander with puppy eyes. Alexander nodded and said, What's wrong with him? Greg was sitting in the corner of the room sulking. In his hand he was squeezing a stress ball, it was quite apparent that he was in a bad mood. Can't you guess? He tried to bid for one of the items, but lo and behold, Alyssa outbid him. Alyssa? Alexander repeated, surprised. That was the name of Greg's girlfriend, or ex-girlfriend. It was hard to keep track, they kept breaking up and getting back together so frequently one never knew what their status was from day to day. What is she even doing here? Who knows? 
Greg answered, his annoyance apparent in his voice. She probably couldn't live with the fact that I broke it off once and for all. She's just trying to get my attention. How many times have you broken up with her, once and for all, by now? Six. Seven times? Seven times, Helen confirmed, completely disregarding Greg's annoyance. But only if you don't count when they broke up twice on the same day last Christmas. This is not funny. Greg roared, giving Helen a dirty look. But unfortunately for him, neither of his friends took him seriously. The mood in the private room was relaxed and full of banter, as one would expect from a group of teenagers. No one mentioned Zeus even as time went on, but the longer it went the more Greg squeezed his stress ball, though only Alexander seemed to notice. Finally something happened that attracted Alexander's attention. The auctioneer mentioned a last-minute addition to the auction. Alexander leaned forward and focused on stage. He was truly a bit curious as to what could attract the attention of the mysterious girl. Ladies and gents, you truly will not believe the treat we have for you today. Everyone here must have heard rumors of a village in Egypt inaccessible to all cultivators, even if they may be in the body-tempering realm. The village that seems to be nothing special, but is said to be protected by the goddess Batet. For thousands of years, as far back as records go, this village and its residents have been left undisturbed by history. Protected from war, protected from famine, protected from any kind of tribulation, this unnamed village has passed through the annals of history as a mystery. It was true, what the auctioneer said. Alexander had also heard about it, the village that worshipped the goddess Batet was one of the forbidden zones of the world that no cultivator had ever entered. Mortals, however, had found their way in and even made videos, but could not discover anything significant about the village. Any mortals who tried to harm the village however would mysteriously disappear. Although it was a forbidden zone, if no one tried to invade its territory no one would be harmed so it was considered the least threatening. Before Alexander started cultivating he had tried to look for the village himself once, but unfortunately the entrance to the village could not always be found and depended on luck. Well our guests would be pleased to learn that earlier today, a resident from that village sold two spirit artifacts the likes of which have never been seen. The artifacts are in the shape of a key, the auctioneer waved his hand signaling a woman who walked onto the stage holding a purple, velvet pillow. On the pillow were placed two golden keys, attracting all the eyes in the venue. The use for these artifacts cannot be determined yet, but when held they release a warm current of spiritual energy through the body that seem to have a healing effect. Our appraisers strongly suspect that the keys lead to an ancient, unknown heritage waiting to be discovered. The auctioneer beamed as he spoke and waited for a moment for his audience to absorb what was said. Both keys will be auctioned separately. We will begin the bidding at $50 million as well as 5,000 spirit stones. All bids must be at least $100,000 and 100 spirit stones. Auctions in the cultivation world were often like this. Money on its own was too useless to a cultivator, so spirit coins or spirit stones would also be used. Sometimes spirit stones would be used alone, but although money didn't help with cultivation it wasn't as if money had no value at all which is why most often it was some combination of both. Before anyone had a chance to consider whether to bid or not, Alexander had already placed his bid. $500 million, 10,000 spirit stones and one grade 4 purple spirit pill. Everyone in the hall froze in shock. A grade 4 pill was one meant for foundation realm cultivators, and the purple spirit pill was a rather famous pill used to heal internal wounds quickly. It was an extremely rare pill that most people used in life or death situations, and now it was being used to pay for a key. Although the auctioneer had hyped up the key saying it could lead to a heritage, there was no proof of that, it was only a possibility. It really wasn't the kind of thing someone would gamble on, at least this much. But to Alexander this price was irrelevant. He simply wanted to quickly get the key before his conspirators began their little play. After a few moments, when no one else bid the auctioneer shouted, sold, with all his enthusiasm and started the bidding for the next key, but once again a voice rang out in the hall. $500 million, 10,000 spirit stones and one grade 4 purple spirit pill. Shock. Awe. Horror. These feelings gripped everyone in the hall, and even the auctioneer began to wonder if there were more secrets behind the keys they weren't aware of. In fact, even Helen and Greg were surprised by Alexander's brazen spending. He was not someone who carelessly wasted money, even if he had a lot of it. Do you know what those keys do? Helen finally asked, her voice trembling a bit. No, but someone asked me to get the keys. I am just getting them for that person. Alexander's words scared the two kids in his room a bit. Who would dare use Alexander Morrison as a middleman? Could it be, the elder from his family? Before the conversation could go any further someone knocked on Alexander's door. The young man raised an eyebrow in curiosity. The keys were still on stage with the auctioneer, so it couldn't be someone from the auction house bringing him his prize. 
Were his assassins about to begin their little performance? Chapter 45 The Keys Come in, Alexander said casually, as if unsuspecting of anything. He pretended not to notice Greg squeezing his stress ball even harder. Internally he was amused quite a bit, should a would-be assassin really be using a stress ball? In fact, what he did not know was that Greg was constantly in a lot of pain, as he was not inherently a goo cultivator. Goo were similar to spiritual beasts, but instead of beasts they were insects. Goo cultivators nurtured the goo in their own bodies and shared everything from nutrients to spiritual energy. It was quite a rare form of cultivation, and was widely frowned upon not only because of how dark the practices were, but also because most people found it too disgusting to let goo enter their bodies. Nevertheless, goo allowed people with low inherent cultivation talent to easily surpass their natural limits as their cultivation depended on the goo instead. The door opened and an elderly man entered followed by two bodyguards. The old man had a slight hunch and snow-white hair, but his eyes were energetic and warm. Senior Hamad Alexander acknowledged, slightly surprised, as he quickly got up to greet the old man. This old man was actually quite old, at around 230 years. Although the average life expectancy for a golden core cultivator was 250 years, it was rare for them to actually reach or come close to such an age as 250 was considered the maximum and not a necessity. If golden core cultivators had a weak foundation or suffered from injuries their life expectancy would naturally be reduced. Which is why his long life was a surprise to many people as he was a war veteran from one of the last cultivator wars to take place on earth. Naturally as someone with status the senior had crossed paths with Alexander's family before, even though they had never met themselves. Sit, sit, there's no need for formalities. I just had to come see you when I recognized your voice, I hadn't realized that you had come to Cairo. Since Alexander was standing, Greg and Helen had stood up as well and stood behind him respectfully. They bowed to the senior but didn't say anything. I came on vacation with my friends. We're celebrating my breakthrough. Ah yes, your breakthrough, the old man said, taking a seat. His two bodyguards stood behind him with their backs against the wall. Congratulations. My boy, congratulations. What an age the world has come to, what an age. Back in my day, one could not even dare to imagine entering the foundation realm before the age of fifty. The old man's eyes stared out into the distance, as if reminiscing. Indeed, Alexander agreed, taking a seat as well, with space travel and terraforming technology, we have access to more spirit stone mines than ever before. In fact, we have already started preparing for asteroid mining as well as planning to explore Jupiter's moons. In the future, things will only get better. Phenomenal, what a time to be alive. But as they say, an age is built by the men of its times. I have no doubt that you'll be setting even more records soon. Not to mention, you've even gotten your hands on those two inheritance keys from the goddess's village. There was a subtle change in Hamad's voice at this point, and an air of tension filled the room. Hamad was still smiling, and the bodyguards had not moved, but Alexander sensed a stir in the natural flow of spirit energy in the room. Spirit energy was like air, it seemed to be present everywhere in the world. When something interacted with it, the spirit energy tended to develop a flow, similar to the wind. But random things did not cause a stir in spirit energy, meaning a person walking through a room would not affect the spirit energy in the room. But if there was a person meditating in the corner of the room, spirit energy would flow towards that person, and the people sensitive to spirit energy would feel that flow similar to how a person could feel wind on their skin. Currently, it wasn't the spirit energy of the room that was moving but rather of the general area. Well so far there is no telling what the keys are. They may turn out to be nothing more than decoration pieces otherwise the owner would not have sold them. True, true, there's no telling what their use is yet. Still, you were quite decisive in the way you bought both of them. Some people may think you may know what they're used for. Alexander smirked internally. He was giving the man respect due to age and achievements, but that did not mean it gave the old man the right to interrogate him. Who could question what Alexander did? But all this was only an internal monologue, he still wanted to see the performance that had been prepared for him. A friend of mine took interest in the keys so I am only acquiring them for her. I have no personal interest in the keys, nor do I know much about them. How fortunate it is to be your friend, the old man remarked and let out a chuckle. Before the conversation could continue there was a knock on the door, and a smartly dressed lady walked in with a briefcase. Your keys, she said to Alexander with a warm smile and handed over the briefcase before quickly leaving. At this time, all eyes in the room were on the briefcase in Alexander's hand. Even Helen, who had so far maintained a calm expression, wore a worried look. Alexander, though, pretended like he did not notice at all and calmly opened the briefcase to take a closer look at his prize. The truth was, the mysterious girl had only asked for one of the keys but he had gotten both because he wanted to know what was so special about them. 
On a closer look, Alexander could immediately tell they were not decoration pieces. Even without touching them he could feel them radiating warmth, and they seemed to have an alluring shine to them. Though what was a little strange was that while the auctioneer said that they had a healing effect, Alexander's instincts were telling him otherwise. He felt like a wider horizon awaited him so long as he took hold of the keys. How was he supposed to know that the key affected everyone differently? It was just that the spirit energy on earth was scarce, not to mention polluted. Most cultivators here carried injuries due to improper cultivation, which is why the key always gave them a feeling that it could heal them. Alexander, on the other hand, had been guided and taken care of by numerous professionals. Even when he sustained injuries or made mistakes in cultivation, his recovery was always assured. Which is why the feeling he got was not one of healing, but of freedom. Although he was not constrained anymore by his training and had the freedom to live how he wanted, the freedom was relatively new and he had not had a chance to taste it yet, so naturally that is what his heart still yearned for. May I take a look? Hamad asked, waking Alexander from his reverie. His voice was no longer as soft as it had been, and his expression not as gentle as it was. Alexander looked at the old man with an amused look, but handed the briefcase over. Helen and Greg both looked tense now, though they sat behind Alexander so he could not see their faces. The atmosphere in the room had become even more tense, but Alexander maintained his calm as if he had not noticed. The old man stared at the keys with evident greed in his eyes, and slowly crept one of his hands closer to the keys. Just as it was about to touch the key, however, he stopped himself and quickly withdrew his hand. It's a shame I didn't know the keys would be auctioned sooner, or else I might have prepared to buy them as well. The old man closed the briefcase and held it out for Alexander to take back. The young man reached forward to take it, and just as Alexander took it back it happened. The old man, a late Golden Core stage cultivator, launched a dagger at Alexander, who was only a few feet away from him. The dagger was not a normal dagger, as it had the special function of being able to piece through any kind of spirit energy shield. But that was not all. At the same time that the old man attacked, the walls of the private room exploded and it seemed several projectiles shot towards Alexander, and even Helen as well as Greg. All this happened in a moment, and in less than a tenth of a second the old man's dagger had reached Alexander's throat. While a momentous event was taking place on earth, Lex found himself soaking in a bath in one of his free guest rooms, drinking a pina colada. Figuring out how to make MP was really too stressful, and coming this close to potentially dying was way too much for him to take right now. So he decided to take a little break, to give his brain rest so that it could work better later. That was totally the reason. It definitely wasn't because he discovered that the inn also provided bath bombs should a guest ask for one, and wanted to try it out. He took another sip of his drink, from a paper straw of course, before mentally adjusting the temperature of the water and raising it by a few degrees. He should think about adding some hot springs to the inn. Chapter 4660 Seconds Alexander, who had been reaching out earlier to retrieve the keys, did not move to evade the incoming dagger, but only looked at Hamad with amusement in his eyes. The dagger reached him unimpeded, but when it struck his neck it sounded as if it hit a metal wall and sparks flew. Debris and dust flew into the room as several other attacks broke through the walls towards him, making it hard to see for a moment. However, when the dust cleared Alexander could be seen sitting casually on his chair, leaning back with his right leg atop his left. Helen and Greg, who were caught completely unprepared by the attacks, were picking themselves up from the floor, somehow unhurt as well. Hamad stood up, his two bodyguards standing beside him, and seven other people in masks entered the room and surrounded the teens, giving off a threatening aura. All the people who had surrounded them were Golden Core cultivators. Go on, continue, said Alexander mockingly. Attack a few more times, I won't dodge, I promise. But the ten cultivators didn't attack, and only stared at them. They were trying to figure out how the three kids survived the attack, but could not see anything. Helen and Greg came and stood close to Alexander, the fear on their faces real. Do you know what you're doing? Greg asked, trying to sound threatening. Do you know who we are? Oh they know, commented Alexander, slowly standing up. He looked Hamad dead in the eyes, the earlier amused expression changing to something more serious. What's the matter, old geezer, confused? Times have changed since you last saw action. The world isn't so simple anymore. Alexander would, of course, not explain how or why he had managed to remain intact from the earlier attacks. The truth was his body was covered by something called red gold dust, a unique metal his family discovered and processed on Mars. It was an unreactive metal, and had few if any uses at all normally. However whenever spiritual energy was released by a golden core cultivator, the ore would absorb it readily, to the point of disrupting spiritual techniques and formations. Whether the energy was directed towards the metal or not, it would absorb it. When the metal absorbed enough energy, it would evaporate. 
Alexander's family had processed it into a defensive treasure that would not absorb all golden core energy, only attacks in a certain radius. This is why even Helen and Greg remained relatively unharmed by the attacks. Of course, even with most of its energy gone the dagger that attacked Alexander still had enough momentum to cut through him, but Alexander had employed a defensive technique for body cultivators that turned his skin into metal. The only drawback of that technique was that he could not move while he used it. I'm impressed, said Hamad, I cannot figure out how you avoided the attacks. But I believe if we keep attacking, your defensive measures will eventually run out. So what, you're going to threaten me now? Follow you, or you'll kill me? Alexander looked around, trying to see if he could recognize any features of his assailants. Though they were wearing masks, he could recognize some of the techniques they had used earlier so he had a good guess as to their identities. They were all experts, and Alexander thought it was highly likely that there were more assassins still hiding. The auction house was in chaos, guests were screaming and running around, yet somehow no security was coming towards them. I could ask you all why you're doing this, and what's your motive. But to be honest, I don't care. Since you've attacked me, you should all just die. As soon as Alexander spoke he pulled out what looked like a tarot card from his pocket and crumpled it. The ten assassins tried to stop him, but even at this distance, before they could reach the three teenagers disappeared. Find them. Hamad roared. They must be nearby. Indeed, they had not teleported far. The three of them appeared on the road outside the auction house, only some fifty meters away. We need to hold out for about sixty seconds, Alexander said, looking at his two companions. Do you have any defensive equipment? None that can defend against golden core cultivators, Greg said, in a shaky voice. Helen gave Alexander a reluctant smile, indicating the same. We'll just have to make do, Alexander said, before grabbing the two and bolting away from the auction house. Only a couple seconds later their ten assailants broke through the building and appeared right behind them. Searching for the kids wasn't a difficult task, a simple sweep of their spirit sense eventually revealed them. Fortunately for the three teenagers, Alexander was practically covered in spirit tech, although it was not quite apparent. His shoes aided him in running which, along with his body cultivation and movement technique, had already put him at quite the distance. What about Zeus? Helen asked as Alexander sprinted down the busy road. We'll find him later, we just need to wait for fifty more seconds, the running teenager said. His expression was focused, but he did not look too worried. However, even with his many advantages his pursuers ultimately had a higher cultivation level and were approaching quickly. Hamad, who was at the forefront of the ten cultivators, threw another dagger at the teenager, holding nothing back. The dagger was covered in a visible red aura that gave off a malevolent feeling. Before the dagger could reach Alexander it was blocked by a blade that appeared floating behind the boy. Five more blades, all two feet long, appeared hovering in the air behind Alexander and began defending him from some attacks as he continued to run. The six blades were Alexander's primary weapons, and all were coated in red gold dust, but even then blocking attacks put a great strain on Alexander, especially since he was using his spirit sense to determine where the attacks were coming from and blocking them. Unfortunately, things only become more difficult. Some of the assassins ran ahead of them and intercepted Alexander. Alexander immediately tried to change directions and run into a building, but it was already too late. He had once again been surrounded. He dropped his two friends on the ground to free his hands, and turned all his focus on his enemies. Since he had teleported out, only 27 seconds had passed. He needed to delay for another 33 seconds. Stay close to me, Alexander said, but before he could explain more he felt someone grab his leg. He looked down to see his friend, to see the person who was once his friend, Greg, firmly grabbing onto his right calf. From his hand an extremely gruesome-looking worm protruded out and tried to burrow into Alexander's leg. Alexander quickly deployed his defensive technique, titanium skin, but to his immense surprise the worm was able to tear through his hardened skin and enter his leg. A valiant effort, Hamad said, as he slowly clapped. But you're still just a boy. Though you put up a good fight for someone your age, Hamad was continuing his speech but Alexander was not listening. He was only looking at Greg, who wore a look of shame and guilt. Ultimately Greg looked away, unable to bear the gaze of the young man he had just condemned to death. Alexander turned to look at Helen and found that she too was looking at Greg, disappointment painting her beautiful face. Did you know, he asked her softly. The young girl paused for a moment, biting her lower lip till it started bleeding. Ultimately she shook her head and said, I didn't know anything about Greg. And did you know about Zeus? Was Zeus involved as well, she asked, surprised. Her question in it of itself gave him an answer. So you didn't know about these two, but you did know about the assassination. What was your role in all this? Helen was about to answer but Hamad, who was becoming impatient, interrupted. Enough. 
boy you've been implanted with a worm from the heart meridian mother goo. Your life is in my hands, so obediently put down your blades and stop resisting or you'll soon know the meaning of wishing for death. Alexander looked towards the old geezer indifferently, before looking up at the night sky. Only seven seconds remained, and in the night sky he could see ten shooting stars streaking through the night sky towards him. Chapter 47 Traitors? Hamad was about to lose his temper at Alexander's casual attitude when he suddenly heard a soft roaring in the distance. The sound, though soft at first, was quickly becoming louder. He looked up in the sky towards where Alexander was looking and saw ten flaming balls shooting towards them at breakneck speed. Dodge, was all he had time to shout before the ten flaming balls crashed into the ground before them, completely destroying the road and launching debris everywhere. A cloud of dust filled the air, but it was quickly blown away by a gust of wind revealing ten tall, cylindrical pods. A hatch on one of them was kicked open, revealing a soldier, fully armored in black, synthetic gear. Immediately after the other pods were opened as well, revealing the soldiers within. They all were dressed identically, and with a mask over their face you would not be able to tell them apart if they weren't all carrying different weapons. One of the soldiers who was carrying an axe and a shield walked towards Alexander and kneeled before shouting, Titan 036 reporting for duty. Alexander looked at the golden core cultivator kneeling before him, but maintained an indifferent expression on his face. I want the airspace above all of Egypt sealed and all outgoing traffic stopped. I want full deployment of the 3rd Morrison Brigade in all of Egypt, and all cultivator movement needs to be temporarily stopped. I want the owner of that auction house found and captured, and I want the regional head for ADF in our custody as well. Evacuate nearby civilians and capture all of my assailants. If capture becomes too difficult simply kill them. I also need a set of acupuncture needles, but if none of you have a set, a very sharp knife will do. You have your orders Titans, roared Titan 036 as he quickly turned around and started chasing Alexander's assassins. As soon as the pods had crashed onto the road the assassins started to flee, deploying all kinds of techniques eliminating their traces, but that was none of Alexander's concerns. He did not doubt the titan's ability to find them. One of the titans approached Alexander and handed him a black pouch, before quickly leaving as well. None of the titans stayed behind to protect Alexander in case more assassins came after him, it was as if the idea of him being in danger never occurred to them at all. Greg and Helen stood frozen, feeling a mix of shock and horror at what was happening. Soldiers had dropped from the sky? Deploying troops in all of Egypt? Capture the region head of ADF? The ADF was the African Defense Front, similar to Bluebird in that it was responsible for monitoring cultivator activity in Africa, but different from Bluebird in that instead of being one organization it was a cluster of smaller organizations banding together. Still, that did not mean the ADF was weak, or something that could be casually be messed with. Ignoring their confusion, Alexander turned towards Greg and dashed towards him. Before he had time to realize what was happening, Alexander punched hard directly in the stomach. The wind left Greg's body as he keeled over in pain, vomiting out the contents of his stomach. But that wasn't the worst of it, Alexander had not only punched him, he had released a burst of spiritual energy in Greg's body directly burning his meridians. All the spiritual energy Greg had accumulated in his life left his body, for he had become crippled. Paying no mind to his reaction Alexander flipped him over and removed his shirt, before taking out four acupuncture needles. The titans naturally didn't keep these needles for medicinal purposes. They were coated in poison and could be used as hidden weapons, not to mention they were made from a metal that conducted spiritual energy increasing their uses manifold. Using a simple spirit technique, Alexander summoned a flame in his hand which he used to sterilize the acupuncture needles and vaporize any poison on it he could not afford to accidentally kill Greg before his task was complete. Once the needles were sterilized he directly injected them into Greg's heart, until they eventually reached the Heart Meridian Mother Goo. As its name suggested, the Heart Meridian Mother Goo attached itself to the meridians around one's heart. The Mother Goo fed on the spiritual energy coursing through the meridians to lay eggs, which would eventually hatch and then could be implanted to other bodies. The Child Goo would also find its way to the heart of its new host, but unlike its mother instead of feeding on the spiritual energy it would go dormant. The user of the mother goo could send signals to the child goo and control it to attack its host's heart, ultimately gaining control over the host's life. Alexander was familiar with the goo, and thus naturally knew effective ways to deal with it. Removing both the mother and child goo had to be done carefully, as any damage to the meridians was extremely difficult to heal. That's why the first thing Alexander did was cripple Greg, so that he would lose control over the mother goo. Then, before the mother goo had a chance to do anything Alexander pierced its body with the acupuncture needles and channeled his own spiritual energy through them to gain control of the mother goo. 
At this point he slowed down, as he could not afford to be careless, and commanded the mother goo to remove the child goo from his body. The mother goo resisted for a bit, as it was unfamiliar with this new spiritual energy, but eventually sensing a threat to its life the goo gave in. Alexander felt the child goo in his body making its way to his skin. The time was too short and it had not yet reached Alexander's heart, which made the process simpler. Finally, from near his stomach it broke through his skin and fell out, wriggling on the ground. Alexander gave it a disgusted look before burning it. Finally free from danger, Alexander removed the acupuncture needles from Greg and turned to look towards Helen. By now, she had calmed down a lot and she only looked towards her two friends with sadness in her eyes. I believe we were in the middle of a conversation, Alexander said, his tone calm and casual as if he had not just crippled one of his oldest friends and then left him on the ground to die. You asked me what my role was in this, Helen said, strangely quite calm herself. To be honest, I don't know what they wanted, but I can speculate. By they you mean your family? Was it your parents? I don't know, she said forlornly. I received instructions via the official family channels, but I cannot be sure who gave the orders. I guess that was a contingency, in case things don't go according to plan. In fact, I think they depended on things not going according to their plans. Oh, what makes you say that? My only job was to poison you. There were ten poisons, called the ten poisons of Ishkbal. Do you know what they do? This question troubled Alexander slightly, as despite his extensive education he had never heard of them before. Based on his delay in answering Helen was able to guess the answer. They're strange. On their own, the poisons do nothing. They lay dormant in your body, potentially forever, but if all ten are combined together in the bloodstream, they all begin to act independently. All ten have different effects, and not all are lethal. One affects the stability of your meridian, one pollutes your spiritual energy, one develops extremely painful rashes all over your body, one affects your brain, the rest I wasn't able to figure out. But I think the purpose is to confuse doctors, instead of realizing that there are ten different poisons doctors might think all these symptoms are of one. If they're able to cure the lethal effects, the other poisons will still be able to destroy your cultivation talent, making it impossible for you to ever reach a higher level. Of course, this is just my guess. They gave me next to no information, maybe everything I guessed was wrong to begin with. Those are bold guesses, Alexander said, admittedly alarmed by this dastardly poison. So then, if your family didn't give you any information how were you able to speculate so much, even guessing some of the poison's effects? Helen smiled weakly at her friend. He was so smart in so many ways, but sometimes it was the obvious answers that eluded him. You know, I never resented my family, she said, looking out into the distance. Even though it was obvious that they were raising me to use me, I knew that nothing in this world is free. Instead of the difficult life of an orphan, I lived the pampered life of a rich girl in high society. I got to cultivate with the best resources that others can only even dream of, and had experiences one can ask. In exchange, if all I had to do was marry well then I never thought it was a huge price to pay, not to mention it's not necessary that a political marriage had to be a bad one. She looked at Alexander with tears in her eyes, but he only looked back at her calmly. He was a strange person, sometimes she would think he had a heart of steel, and other times she felt like he was the softest person on earth. Right now before her stood his steel-hearted version, but could he be blamed? His closest friends his entire life had just tried to kill him. I was never ungrateful, and I would have done whatever they asked of me, but when they asked me to betray my friends, how could I? Carefully she reached out towards her hair and pulled at it. She was wearing a wig. Under her wig, her scalp was covered in red boils. I had to ingest the poisons to prime them. They taught me a technique that would transfer all the poison into one drop of blood, and all I needed to do was expose that drop to your skin and then you would be poisoned. But would I really need to expose you to a drop of blood? They gave me so little information, what if the method of transmission is something else? Maybe I only had to be close to you and the poison would be transmitted on its own. Since they had already decided to use me as a pawn, why did they need to tell me the truth? I couldn't take the risk, so I directly used the technique and activated the poison. It's already been a few days, the poison has already been thoroughly absorbed by my body. I don't know what else the poison does, but I expect I don't have much longer to live. This time, Alexander was thoroughly surprised. Zeus escaping like a coward and Greg betraying him at the first opportunity did not face him too much, somehow deep down he expected it. But Helen, the more he looked at her, the more he suddenly started to realize that her complexion wasn't normal. He walked to her and slowly, gently raised his hand to her face. Softly, making sure not to use too much force, he brushed his thumb across her face, removing the many layers of makeup. She looked beautiful, as always, and only a small straight line revealed that beneath the beautiful F.A., Ade was her deathly pale skin, like that of someone on their deathbed. Chapter 48 Puppy Dog Love 
why didn't you just tell me? Alexander asked after a long silence. At this moment he was regretting his earlier confidence. He had many contingencies and plans for today, the cloaked ship that hovered above that sent out the ten titans was just one of them. At no point during the attack of the chase did he ever feel like he was in any real danger. He truly did feel like he was just watching a play, and was waiting for all the actors to try and attack him one by one. The goo breaking through his skin was a surprise, but even so he handled it effortlessly. Now however, he felt lost. He had no idea what he should do. You were in the minor realm when I got the orders. I had no idea about Zeus or Greg, I was only told that someone will try to attack you and that would be the best time to poison you. I guess they never assumed that I wouldn't follow their orders, since they thought I'd be too scared to leave the poison in my own body. I didn't want to take any chances, and I didn't want to live with any regrets. I've led a good and full life, I am not afraid if it ends here. Alexander was once again left speechless. How had he not noticed his friend's peril? Why did it never occur to him that his friends could have been threatened or blackmailed in participating in his assassination? Ugh, puppy dog love. It really makes me nauseous, someone said, startling both Alexander and Helen. They turned to see a short girl with blonde hair standing behind them. She was wearing a mask so her identity was hidden, but Alexander recognized her as the mysterious girl from the minor realm. Here, she said, throwing a briefcase towards Alexander. I've already taken one of the keys, so we can be considered even. If you use the other key, you can take your friend somewhere special. There should be a cure for her there. You don't need to have a dramatic farewell in public like this, it really makes people sick. The mysterious girl sounded irritated, but her immature voice made it difficult for her listeners to take her seriously. She didn't bother waiting for Alexander's reply and turned to leave. Wait, how do I use the key? Alexander asked. I'm not sure but you should be able to figure it out, it should not be too complicated. If I want to contact you in the future, how do I find you? Alexander asked once again, hoping to receive a name. The mysterious girl paused for a moment, as if lost in thought, before giving a reply. My Tempest username is Russian Princess 77 You can contact me through that. Before Alexander had any time to ask her any more questions, she ran away. Alexander noticed that her cultivation level had also reached the Foundation Realm. Who was that? Helen asked, her voice unusually strained, but Alexander ignored her. He opened up the briefcase and took out the remaining key. He held it in his hand, and felt a familiar temptation. He hesitated, should he trust the words of the mysterious Russian Princess 77? But the hesitation lasted only a few moments. Alexander took Helen's hand but before he could do anything else, as if sensing Alexander's intention to use the key it broke. There was a golden flash and the two kids disappeared, leaving a semi-conscious Greg still out on the street. It may have seemed like Lex was wasting time when he was in a serious predicament, but from the moment he decided to somehow get Hugo to exit his room and into the gift shop only an hour had passed. His bath had been warm and relaxing, something he needed to calm himself down so that he didn't take any drastic decisions. The more precarious his situation, the calmer he needed to be. He had gotten redressed and was just about to exit the inn to go smoke, but to his much welcome surprise two new guests appeared at the inn. Ensuring that he looked fine, Lex teleported to the gate to welcome his guests. Two teenagers stood at the entrance holding hands, bewildered as they looked around at their new surroundings. The boy was tall and handsome, and even in his surprised state, gave off an aura of self-confidence. The girl was once beautiful as well, but with the power of the in Lex could clearly see that she had been badly disfigured by various rashes all over her body. Ignoring their appearances Lex quickly checked their details. Name, Alexander Morrison. Power level. Foundation Realm, Initial. Species, Human. Midnight and Prestige Level, Not Yet Available. Name, Helen Sigmund. Power Level, Chi Training, Seventh Step. Species, Human. Midnight and Prestige Level, Not Yet Available. Welcome guests, to the Midnight Inn, he said warmly. The universe's foremost establishment for rest, recovery and anything else you may desire. I am the innkeeper, your host. Wasting no time, Alexander said, my friend has been poisoned and I was told that you have a way of curing her. Is that true? Told? Lex thought curiously. But instead of pondering on it, Lex turned towards Helen and focused. Normally a guest would have to enter the recovery room for him to see a detailed report on their health, but ultimately the inn was his and if he focused on a guest he could still view their condition. Name, Helen Sigmund. Condition. Several poisons absorbed in the bloodstream. Severe rashes all over body. Slight bruising. Report. Several poisons have affected the patient's system, but the potency of the poisons is not strong. Can be healed with recover pod or botlam do. Indeed, such a simple request is easily taken care of. You can choose one of two treatments. 
We have a remedy called Botlam Dew for 200 MP, if given to your friend it can easily resolve the issue in a few hours. The other treatment is to take your friend to the recovery pod, which will allow the body to naturally overcome the poison. This method is slower and more expensive at 250 MP, but it will allow her body to gain a natural immunity to such poisons. We'll use the recovery pod, Alexander said decisively, not giving Helen a chance to say anything. From his pocket he withdrew a black credit card and handed it to Lex. You can charge all our expenses on this. Sensing the young man's urgency, Lex smiled and waved his hand, teleporting the three to the recovery room. Please lie down on the table, the treatment will begin shortly. Helen gave Alexander a meaningful look before lying down in the recovery pod. The recovery started and Lex felt the sweet, sweet exhilaration of earning some MP. But from the way Alexander didn't seem to care at all about the price, Lex had the sneaking suspicion that he could earn more. He had to play his cards right. For now he didn't say anything, letting Alexander watch as the recovery pod began its work, though there really wasn't much that could be seen from the outside. The recovery pod pushed the body's ability to heal, so all the work that was being done was internal and would take a while. Eventually, when he realized that all he could do now was wait, Alexander stepped away from the recovery pod and for the first time took a good look at his surroundings. The other recovery pod quickly caught his eye, and when he saw who was inside he was startled. Is that Marlo? Is he here as well? Oh, do you recognize him, said Lex, stepping towards the normally sized man. It occurred to him that Marlo looked very different from his normal state, it was unusual for anyone to recognize him. Yes, he used to be my teacher once. What happened to him? Lex smiled and said, if you stay here a while, you can ask him yourself when he recovers. It would be rude of me to divulge our guest's affairs. Alexander nodded, as if what Lex said made sense. He completely did not realize that Lex had already begun his plans to make Alexander a long-term guest at the inn. Chapter 49 House Arrest Alexander stared at Marlowe for a while, his thoughts hidden behind his stoic face. Externally Marlowe looked completely fine so Alexander could not tell how severe the man's condition was, but he must have gone through something extremely drastic to change so much. Did you say this is an inn? he finally asked, turning away from his old mentor and towards the mysterious innkeeper. Indeed, Lex answered glad to have his customer's attention back. Our patrons come from all across the universe, and come to get away from the troubles of mundane, everyday life. Come, let me give you a tour. Your friend will need some time to heal. Thank you. My name is Alexander, my friend's name is Helen. I apologize for not introducing ourselves earlier. Nonsense, there is no need to apologize. You came here to resolve your troubles, and that is the first thing that you did once you arrived. It is only right. Do you get many guests from Earth? Alexander asked as the innkeeper led him out of the recovery room. The Midnight Inn must be a huge secret since he hadn't heard of it before. Lex, on the other hand, found his lack of response at there being sentient life out in the universe interesting, as other than Batet and Phallic, the few guests he had all were overwhelmed. A few, Lex responded. We have only recently connected the Inn to Earth, which is why it is understandable that not many Earthlings have had a chance to visit so far. I expect that it should not be long before they start visiting more often and anyone with a golden key can enter? Naturally. We accept all guests, so long as they do not break any rules of the Midnight Inn. Golden keys can be randomly found across your planet, and anyone who has been a guest receives another one when they leave. Of course, if a guest desires to get more keys to give out to friends and family they can purchase them at the gift shop. As Lex took Alexander to walk around the inn, he noticed that his guest took everything in his stride. The inn, the scenery, the peaceful environment all seemed as if they were completely natural to him. Based on that Lex guessed that Alexander's identity might not be simple on Earth, but he would not intentionally probe him. At most, he would search him up when Lex returned to his apartment. When Lex took him to the gift shop, however, he finally received the shocked and surprised reaction he had come to enjoy from his new guests. Looking at the few items on display Alexander naturally would not recognize them, however each time he focused on an item he would somehow be informed of its use in his head. How long do you think Helen will need before she recovers, Alexander asked his attention still on the items in the gift shop. The items on display were only a few, and it wasn't as if he hadn't seen other treasures with similar effects, but they were rare and would not be sold easily. What really amazed Alexander was the Tier 4 core, which would help Golden Core body refiners. Items that could affect Golden Core cultivators were extremely rare on Earth, let alone ones that could affect body cultivators. He needed to confirm if it really did as it was promoted. It should take a day or two at most. It really depends on how quickly her own body adapts to the poisons. In that case, if I rent a room can she stay there? Yes, if you rent a regular room one other guest can accompany you during your stay. If you rent a courtyard, three other guests can accompany you. 
I'd like to rent a regular room for a week then, and I'd like a tier 3 core as well. Alexander once again took out his black credit card and Lex quickly swiped it for a total of 1850. His total MP was 2241 now, filling his immediate need for MP. Velma, who was behind the counter in the gift shop, took out a tier 3 core and transformed it from a core into a card with a picture of the core on one side and the initials MI on the back in gold. This was the packaging for items sold through the gift shop. Instead of getting the item directly, it would be transformed into a card. When the guest would need the item he would only need to think about it while holding the card, and it would transform back into the item sold. This did not seem so important at the moment, but in the future if a guest bought many items, or items of a considerable size this would make it easy for them to transport the items. Alexander's eyes gleamed as he saw the core turn into a card, and when Lex explained to him how to use the card he was most pleased. This was a very discreet way of transporting items, if he could somehow learn how to turn items into cards the benefits would be endless. Yet he was not so delusional as to think anyone would casually teach him such a technique. Little did he know, even if Lex were willing to teach him, Lex himself had no idea how to do it. This was a function the imp performed automatically. Alexander took the card and followed Gerard, who had appeared with a tray of lemonade, to his room. Alexander was in a bit of a rush, he had to return to Egypt quickly, but he wanted to confirm the core's ability first. It was too important. It would drastically change his plans if the effects were real. As soon as he entered his room he turned the card back into a core and sat down with it in his hand. He closed his eyes and started absorbing the energy in the core. He wanted to start slowly, to be careful in case some accident happened, but the energy burst into his body like a raging flood and he was not able to control it. Yet he also knew immediately that the effects were real, and much better than he had anticipated. When he had broken through to the Foundation Realm earlier, he had broken through in his body cultivation as well as spirit cultivation. He did not expect to make any progress in the short term, yet right now he knew that that would not be the case. Lex was swooning as he truly admired how amazing his luck was. Just as he desperately needed MP to continue healing Marlowe, a guest had appeared out of nowhere to shower him in MP. Based on his reactions, Lex suspected that this Alexander would not shy away from buying even more things from the gift shop. But he was also curious about how Alexander got his key, and who exactly told him that Helen could be healed here. After thinking about it for a while, he could only assume that Batet had passed one of her two keys to him. That made Alexander's identity even more worthy of notice. He returned to his apartment and opened up his laptop to search the names of both of his two new guests to see if he could find anything on them. But before he could do anything he received an emergency notice from Bluebird. All cultivators are immediately put under house arrest. Any non-authorized cultivator found roaming the city would be persecuted as a terrorist. All organizations are to cease any ongoing activities immediately. Before he could fathom exactly what could prompt such a drastic notice, his computer screen was flooded with Tempest posts about war breaking out in Egypt. Civilian websites were reporting a terrorist attack, but according to random posts on Tempest a battle between cultivators had broken out. ADF was unreachable and no one could tell what was happening on ground because all networks in the area had been shut down. While Lex was absorbed in the shock of what was happening his phone started ringing. He picked it up and was slightly surprised to find that Larry was calling him. Hey Larry, Lex said in an unsure tone. Hey Lex, replied the voice in an anxious tone. I don't mean to inconvenience you but I was hoping for a favor. I'm in the city but my apartment is too far out for me to return to it quickly. Would it be possible for me to stay at your place for a short while? I really don't want to be arrested by random bluebird agents for not getting back home quick enough. Lex was stunned for a moment, but quickly told Larry to come over. He sent him the address to his apartment and began waiting. Maybe Larry would have a better idea of what was happening. Chapter 50 ICPA While waiting for Larry, Lex continued to search the Bluebird portal for details of what happened, there were countless rumors, about war breaking out in the region, about an ancient heritage that had been uncovered, about a unique treasure that had been uncovered that attracted all the rich and powerful. However there was no credible news. Neither Bluebird nor any other organization released a statement about what was actually happening, just that all cultivator activity had to cease temporarily. Regardless of whatever it was, Lex was most confused about why he would be affected by it in New York if a battle happened in Egypt. Based on everything he knew, despite the fact that there was always a lot of security cultivators engaged in battles all the time, Lex was lost in his thoughts for a while before he was woken from his reverie by the sound of knocking on his door. He opened the door a badly bruised and sweaty Larry, standing at his doorstep with a small duffel bag full of clothes. What happened? Lex asked out of concern. Are you alright? Did you get into a fight? No no, don't be alarmed. Larry said, his voice still as energetic and cheery as ever. 
I was at work when the Bluebird notification went out. I work as a combat partner, a few bruises here and there are pretty common. Normally I go to a doctor after my sessions who fixes this right up, but the club had to shut down in a hurry so I didn't get time. I was gonna go home but the commute is usually an hour long, I didn't know what the Bluebird agents would have done to me if they found me still out so long after the emergency broadcast. I didn't want to risk it, I hope you don't mind. Not at all, Lex said, bringing Larry in. Why don't you shower and freshen up first, we can talk after. Thanks, Larry said, showing a grateful smile, and walked into the bathroom with his bag. Lex grew a little more curious about this class fellow of his. He didn't doubt that Larry worked as a sparrer or trainer or whatever, but Lex had seen Larry fight during the self-defense class. He wasn't so easily beaten, nor was he so easily bruised. There was more to his situation than he let on, but since Larry didn't want to say he would not intrude. While waiting for Larry he continued to surf the portal for more news. There were countless conspiracies, but little of anything concrete. Someone had even brought to attention the fact that Marlowe had cancelled some of his business meetings for this entire week and had recently just disappeared from public view. Although Lex knew that Marlowe was famous, he was surprised that someone would so thoroughly check his details and bring him into whatever this incident was. Half an hour later Larry exited the bathroom in a fresh set of clothes, and although his bruises were still there at least he wasn't sweaty anymore. That felt great, Larry said, throwing himself onto the couch. Sorry for intruding like that, I hope your girlfriend doesn't mind me staying here. Larry winked at Lex lecherously, and looked around the apartment for any signs of that girlfriend. I live alone, Lex said, amused at Larry's obsession with girls. Ah, living the bachelor's life. That's fair, no reason to tie yourself down. Lex shook his head, not bothering to explain. In this regard, Larry was hopeless. Do you have any idea what happened? Why did Bluebird send out an emergency broadcast? Whatever happened, it couldn't have been that big. I mean, the non-cultivation world seems to be going on with business as usual. I don't know, but I can take a guess. It must be something to do with one of the International Cultivator Policing Agencies, ICPA. Like Bluebird takes care of New York and a few other states in North America, there are a bunch of such agencies across the world. Whenever one of these agencies encounters an emergency, all agencies worldwide employ a cultivator house arrest. It's not common, but it has happened before. But isn't that a little extreme? I mean, as far as I can tell whatever the cause, it happened in Egypt. Why do we need to be placed under house arrest here? Or the rest of the world for that matter? Instead of replying immediately, Larry looked at Lex with an amused and entertained look. Come on my friend, chasing after girls is fine. But you can't be so absorbed in the act that you become completely uninformed about the rest of the world. Lex rolled his eyes. Which of the two of them was completely absorbed in thoughts of girls? I can tell you haven't really joined any organization, or met any other cultivators outside of class. Otherwise you wouldn't be asking such a basic question. Or at least, you'd have some idea of the reason. I guess it's up to me to educate you. This is going to take a while, do you have any food? Lex had no food at home as he had been eating at the inn lately, so he ordered them a few large pizzas. It might have seemed too much for the two of them, but Lex enjoyed a larger appetite since he started cultivating. Have you ever heard of the God Complex? Larry asked, once Lex finished ordering. But before Lex could answer, Larry continued talking. The God Complex is when a person starts believing themselves to be infallible. They start thinking their abilities are better than everyone else, or that they themselves are inherently better. Amongst mortals, very successful surgeons are known for developing these complexes. Among cultivators, it's even more common. Larry's voice had lost its jovial tone, and for the first time he seemed to be taking something seriously. That's not to say cultivators become bad people. No, most cultivators stay lawful and peaceful and live their own lives without thoughts of hurting others. But the longer one cultivates, and the stronger they become, the more a cultivator slowly starts to see themselves as more than they once were. I mean, with such clear-cut divisions in cultivation it's only natural that as your cultivation rises you think of yourself as better and better. After a certain amount of time, without realizing it, cultivators start thinking of themselves as different, or superior to mortals. I mean, just think about the terminology for non-cultivators, mortals. For the most part, it doesn't make a difference in anyone's day-to-day -day life. But out of a thousand cultivators, if even one develops an inflated ego, can you imagine what that person would do to any mortals he didn't like? If a body-tempering cultivator can completely dominate mortals, can you imagine what a chi cultivator who is having a bad day could do to mortals? Or a chi cultivator who feels a mortal has offended him? Have you ever been bit by a mosquito? Did you feel like squatting all the mosquitoes in the world after feeling that irritating itch? In the past, it was ridiculously common for cultivators to kill mortals over the tiniest inconveniences. 
That is the real reason the ICPAs were formed. To protect mortals from cultivators. Yes, they do much more than that. But if a cultivator killed another cultivator, they may take action, but depending on who the offender is they may get away with a slap on the wrist. However, if a cultivator is caught killing mortals, even if it's a golden core cultivator the ICPAs take serious action. So when an emergency situation occurs, all the ICPAs in the world enforce a house arrest. You're saying whatever the incident that happened was in Egypt, so most likely the authorities over there have their hands full and can't focus on anything else. To avoid cultivators going there and taking advantage of the situation, everyone is put on house arrest. Most people won't even think of taking advantage of something like that, but it only takes one golden core cultivator and the damage can be beyond imagination. A solemn mood hung in the air as Lex absorbed everything Larry had told him. The fact that this is such a big deal means something like that must have happened in the past. But aren't the ICPAs full of cultivators themselves? Who's going to stop them if they're the ones who want to take advantage of a bad situation? Larry shrugged. I don't know. That's the kind of stuff those higher-level cultivators need to think about. We're just at the bottom of the barrel for now, none of this has anything to do with us. Anyway, come on let's see if there's any news on what actually happened. I was too busy before, I haven't been online at all. Lex agreed as he was also curious about the cause of all this commotion. Surprisingly, when he went back onto the portal the first headline he saw read, Alexander Morrison assassinated in Egypt. The familiar name took him by surprise so he completely missed the horrified look on Larry's face. Chapter 51 Change of Plans Lex clicked on the article to read more. The article was on a small blog site where the author interviewed some people who claimed to be present when the assassination took place. According to the unnamed sources, they were present at an auction where an unlisted item was being sold. Supposedly it was a golden key that unlocked some kind of hidden heritage of an ancient cultivator. Alexander bought the keys but before he could get his hands on them he was attacked and robbed, before the assailants escaped the auction house. That was how the event started, and in anger Alexander's family deployed their private military force and were hunting the assassins all over Egypt. Even the ADF was too afraid to step in. The article continued to speculate on a few other things, but Lex and Larry both were too caught up in their thoughts to continue reading. Lex knew for a fact that Alexander was alive, so he took most of the article with a grain of salt, but he was thinking about the golden key. It had been auctioned? Which probably meant that Batet wasn't the one who gave Alexander the keys, but auctioned them off instead. Did a cultivator at her level run short on money? What was going on? This is much worse than I expected, Larry murmured as he took out his phone and made a call. Unfortunately for him, whoever he was calling didn't pick up which agitated him further. What do you mean? Lex asked. Alexander Morrison, do you know who that is? He's the heir to Mars. His family literally owns Mars. There's even some speculation that they've already started mining the various moons of the different planets in the solar system as well. There are even rumors that their family is harvesting spirit energy directly from the sun to create cultivators even stronger than Golden Core, not only is his family rich, they have more Golden Core cultivators than any other force in the solar system. Of course, combined all the other forces are stronger, but who would be crazy enough to ally against them? If someone really has managed to kill Alexander, then things won't end as simply as a lockdown. This could lead to war. Larry continued to make phone calls, but whoever he was calling still wasn't answering. Don't put too much trust in this article, Lex said, aware that Alexander was alive. This isn't even a proper news site. It's just another conspiracy. How can it be easy to assassinate someone that important? He must have been surrounded by bodyguards. I hope you're right. If this, before he could continue whoever he was calling picked up and started talking. Larry didn't speak and only listened. A few moments later he shut the phone and breathed a sigh of relief. You were right, the article wasn't true. Or at least, the part about Alexander being dead isn't true. Lex raised an eyebrow. You must have some insane contacts if they can tell you about what actually happened. Even Bluebird hasn't released a statement yet. Larry froze, realizing that he had lost his composure and exposed a little too much. He let out a defeated laugh and his shoulder slouched, as if letting go of a pretense. I guess there's no point in hiding anything. It's not like it's much of a secret anyway. The only reason you haven't heard is because you're still too new to the cultivation world. Originally, I come from a cultivation family as well, the Dershaw family. We used to own a few spirit stone mines here on earth, and ran the Dershaw bank. When I was growing up I even met Alexander a few times. Our families partnered up in various business ventures. Unfortunately, a few years ago there was an explosion in one of the mines. A lot of the elders from my family went to investigate, but never returned. I don't know the exact details of what happened, but most of the people in my family died that day. 
Afterwards, a few sects showed up, saying that the Dershaw Bank had taken loans from them and it was time to pay it back. All the mines were seized and my family was imprisoned. They probably would have killed my entire family, me included, but the ICPAs intervened. My family was accused of a lot of crimes and banished to somewhere on the moon. I was left behind because I hadn't started cultivating yet. So yeah, that's my story. I still have a few contacts who help me out occasionally secretly, but that's about it. Lex froze after listening to Larry's story, unsure of how he should respond. He was not expecting Larry to unload something so heavy. I'm sorry, I didn't know, Lex said awkwardly but Larry waved it off, returning to his energetic and jovial self. It's old news, don't worry about it. Instead of that, do you know what I found out recently? You remember Matilda, she took a couple of classes with us before she started getting private classes. I heard she's already body tempering fourth level. When I heard I was completely blown away. What a woman. Larry continued talking about Matilda and Lex smiled warily. This guy. Alexander continued to absorb the energy in the core for a few more hours until it was eventually depleted. It took him a few minutes to adjust his state and check his body for any abnormalities. When he finally got up he was exhilarated. The effects of the core were beyond anything he'd used before. He left his room and returned to the gift shop where Velma appeared behind the counter as soon as he entered. Good day, dear guest, she said, her voice soft and pleasant to hear. I hope you are enjoying your stay with us. Please let me know if there is anything you need. My stay has been incredible, but unfortunately I have some tasks I need to complete so I need to leave. Is it possible for me to have a word with the innkeeper? Mary, who was aware of everything that was happening in the inn told Lex, but with Larry in his apartment it was inconvenient for him to leave so he told her to handle the situation. Mary then mentally passed her a few instructions to Velma, who told Alexander, the innkeeper is away on some business at the moment. If there's something I can help you with then do please let me know. In that case, I would like to ask you to take care of Helen while I am away. If she needs further treatment you can charge it on my card, and once she is better please allow her to stay in my room till I come back. I'd also like five more tier 3 cores, one tier 4 core and a spare golden key. Of course, Velma said, handing Alexander the six cards containing his items as well as the key. The five tier 3 cores cost 7500 MP, the tier 4 core 5000 MP and the golden key 100 MP, although since he was technically buying the key directly from the inn and not from Lex, Lex would get no profit from it. All in all, Lex received another 12,500 MP from Alexander though the young man seemed to think nothing of the cost. As for charging his card? Even random websites could save credit card information, how could the Midnight Inn not be able to do the same? The query for how would the inn receive the payments from the bank? It was using an ancient mystical technique called, this is definitely not a plot hole, to carry out the transactions. It left no traces behind and could not be tracked. Done with his tasks, Alexander promptly returned to Earth. It was deep into the night in Egypt at this point, and the street where Alexander returned was dark. The streetlights had been damaged in the brief battle that took place earlier, not to mention from the arrival of the Titan's pods. Alexander took out a phone from pocket and made a video call. On his screen appeared a young man, though despite his youth he wore a look of experience and maturity. You're back, the man said. When your tracker suddenly disappeared I was worried. The Titans have been sweeping the city for you but no one could find you. Yes, I encountered something unexpected. We're going to have to make a few changes to the plan. I need to come back to Mars immediately. What? asked the man, surprised. Are you sure? You've been planning for this for years. Yeah dad, Alexander said. Surprisingly the young man in the video call was Alexander's father, though if you consider that when someone reaches a higher cultivation level their aging seems to slow or even stop, it wasn't that big a deal. Something big has happened. You can release the news that I've been poisoned with some new kind of poison. Also, let a few rumors slip that Helen is dead. As for the details of what actually happened, I better wait till I reach Mars. You should also call grandfather. I feel like he'll be interested in this too. When Alexander mentioned his grandfather, his father's demeanor completely changed and he simply nodded, as if understanding that this matter was unordinary. Also, have someone look into Marlowe's recent actions. I'll see you soon. With that he ended the call and left the area. He seemed completely unaffected by the fact that his previous actions had shaken the entire world. Someone would naturally take care of any fallout. Chapter 52 Gossip Somewhere deep in the Sahara Desert, a lone stranger was walking in the shade of a dune, following the directions of a strange compass. The compass did not point north, but was instead guiding the man towards something specific. Eventually the man reached a point where the compass pointed directly towards. Not wasting any time, the man set up a tent at that exact location before entering. 
Once inside and out of view, he removed the needle of the compass and let it fall into the sand. The needle, as if sentient, began moving downward and the man followed using a spirit technique that let him traverse through the ground. After a few minutes of going down he encountered a strange shield made of energy, formerly known as a formation, but the needle made a hole in the shield just large enough for the man to pass through. Once inside the formation the man increased his descent speed until he reached an underground bunker. Once inside he removed the white cloth he had wrapped around his face, along with the other gear he was wearing and changed into some comfortable robes that he had brought with himself. Not wasting any time he moved deeper into the bunker to what looked like a conference room. All the seats in the conference room were already filled, mostly with holograms but a few with people actually present. Do you have the news? One of the projected men asked. Yes yes, the robed man answered. Plan A and B failed, however according to what I heard Plan C seems to have successfully passed the initial stage. Alexander has been poisoned and is retreating to Mars in an emergency vessel, probably to treat the poison. The Helen girl is dead, so for now they will turn their attention towards the Sigmund family. The infiltration was done cleanly, so there is no evidence that anyone outside of the Sigmund family contacted her. They will be the prime suspects, which should occupy all of the Morrison family's attention. Greg Benice was also killed and even though the Benice family has no idea how he got involved in this, I'm sure they won't hesitate in handing over all of Greg's immediate family to the Morrisons and cooperating with their investigation completely. All in all, it should serve to waste more time. The Zeus Leventus kid however, he has disappeared for now. No one knows where he is, and the Leventus family has reacted unexpectedly. The current Leventus family head has left directly for Mars, his intentions are yet unknown but considering Zeus' role in the assassination, going directly to Mars is a bold play. If the Morrisons take their anger out on them it'll be great, but if they don't it still doesn't matter, said one of the holograms. They're not connected to us in any way. What I'm curious about is how the ADF matter will be handled. No one expected the kid to directly deploy troops on Earth, I can't even begin to imagine what he would have done had he not been poisoned. The reaction was too swift. We will need to be even more careful proceeding forward. I've already handled the matter. Some key personnel have been killed and it's been made to look like suicide. Upon investigation it'll look like they panicked when their plan failed and so took their own lives to hide their trail. No matter how it's investigated, it'll be a deadened. You do not need to waste your time fretting over these details. What matters now is that everyone begins their part in the plan. The top powers on Earth are too secretive, we still cannot figure out how or why, but in the last 200 years anyone who caused too much trouble on Earth has mysteriously vanished. Taking over Mars is our only chance for freedom, and our only chance to break through. There can't be any mistakes. You don't need to tell me, said a lazy voice from a different hologram. You've only been working here for a few years. We've been preparing for this from the day the Morrison family landed on Mars. As for the rest of you, we need to step up on recruitment, the meeting continued as everyone in the room began coordinating on the different steps required for their plan. Unknown to everyone, the fate of billions was being decided casually in this bunker under the desert. Lex and Larry had gotten to know each other quite well in the few hours that they were together in the apartment. From him Lex had also learned a lot about the different organizations in the spirit world, along with correcting some misconceptions he had. For some reason, he always thought that joining an organization was like getting a job at a company. They would give him benefits but make him work in exchange. This was true for a lot of them, but not all. One in particular that aroused Lex's interest was called Balor's Castle. This was an organization made by, and solely for rogue or lone cultivators. Their main purpose, first and foremost, was to provide protection to its members and then secondly it had a lot of miscellaneous services. Joining also had different levels. If you joined as a basic member, then as long as you were in the territory owned by Balor's Castle, they would protect you regardless of who was your enemy, even ICPA. For this level of membership you weren't expected to do anything else, but they heavily promoted helping other members if you ever met them. For higher level members there were obviously more perks, but then of course you had to make a relevant level of contribution. This is what Lex found most interesting. The contribution could be in many forms, and thus it was very flexible. This organization was internationally founded and had almost a dozen Golden Core leaders across the globe. It was something that could be very helpful to Lex, and he jotted down its name in case he ever wanted to join. Larry had also learned a lot from Lex, though Lex sort of regretted sharing. At some point during Larry's incessant prodding Lex had let slip that he had only ever had one girlfriend, during his first year at college. The fact that Lex hadn't dated after that led Larry to weave a tale of a heartbroken Lex, forever pining after his one true love, lost to the materialist allure of modern society. Lex balked, but who had told him to share? Eventually the conversation changed towards their self-defense class, and then Marlowe. 
This was when, for the first time in his life, Lex participated in gossip excitedly. The owner of Ultimate Fighting Fortress was Marlo's wife. It was apparently something that was commonly known but Lex had only found out through Tempest. Nobody knew why there was apparently such enmity between husband and wife, and Larry shared a few outlandish stories he had heard online. The hours went by quickly and the two did not even notice their growing friendship, until late at night when Blue Bird released another broadcast ending the house arrest and returning things to normal. Reluctantly Larry left, for he had much work he needed to do. Oddly enough, Lex found that he had enjoyed the company of the over-enthusiastic fellow. But there was no reluctance on his part, he couldn't wait for Larry to leave. He did not miss the new addition to his MP, and he was practically dying to upgrade his inn. Chapter 53 Disappointment Lex immediately returned to the inn and excitedly asked Mary, what happened? Where did all this MP come from? Who was it? The tiny telegram appeared before, sparkling as she glittered and sparkled while gliding through the air, clearly infected by Lex's emotions. It was Alexander. He bought the zombie cores and left Helen in our care, saying that he'd be back soon. Lex was slightly disappointed that Alexander had left, but he couldn't care at this point. Finally he had a decent amount of MP to spend and he knew exactly how he wanted to spend it. Flying high into the air he looked down at the inn, deciding where exactly he wanted to make some changes. After a few moments of consideration he flew over to the west where he'd created some hills earlier. He made the hills higher and added trees and shrubbery across them, but built a smooth yet winding path through them. At the peak of the highest hill he created flatland dusted with various wild flowers. In the middle he put the one building he'd had his eye on for a while now, the meditation room. It cost him 1200 MP, along with another 300 MP for the remodeling of the hills but it was a necessary expenditure. All of his guests so far had been cultivators, and though they seemed satisfied with the amenities so far, how could they not be provided a place to cultivate? The meditation room was at level 1, which meant it provided only the most basic of advantages for now but that was enough for the moment. On the outside it looked like a hut, but the inside would change according to whoever was using it and would create the most relaxing environment. It provided a higher concentration of spirit energy, and made it easier for people to enter meditation and focus. There was a slight boost to the user's comprehension, meaning anything they were contemplating or meditating on would be easier for them to understand. The meditation room could only host one user at a time, but if he ever needed more he'd create them as necessary. The use of it cost him nothing, so he decided to price it at 100 MP a day. This would be a great attraction, Lex imagined, for his guests. He'd noticed that a lot of them spent some time cultivating or meditating in their room. A specific place that would provide a boost would be even better. Done with his little side project, Lex grinned and did what he had truly been waiting for. He paid 5000 MP for his cultivation upgrade. His new total was instantly brought down to 8241 MP but he didn't care. It was still a lot, and he'd really been waiting to elevate his cultivation. He closed his eyes and waited to be transported to the white room and, nothing. After waiting a bit more, he asked Mary in a confused tone, what's happening? Does the inn need to prepare to elevate my cultivation? Not exactly, she replied after a moment, as if communicating with the inn. Your body hasn't settled down from your first procedure. You underwent a major change, and although it seems like you are fine, your body has not reached the optimal stage to undergo the next procedure. Don't think of this as a video game in which you can upgrade whenever you want, things need to be done step by step. When your body has stabilized and is ready for the next procedure the inn will let you know. If you want to speed up the process, rigorously exerting yourself and then fully recovering will hasten your body stabilization. On the bright side, since you've already paid the price for the upgrade you won't need to worry about it when you're ready. Lex groaned. Of course, his system would never make things easy. Other MCs had systems that made them OP instantly. Other MCs could instantly rule their worlds. He on the other hand had to continuously train and get beat up by a made giant and fight zombies senselessly. The news was disappointing, and it made a dent in his plans. He needed to consider what to do for now. He could slowly take his time, and wait till he's ready and then upgrade before returning to Vegas Minima to drop more golden keys. But he didn't want to go back to that zombie-infested land till he was stronger. Little did he know that he had only encountered the lowest of the low zombies on that planet. If he had landed in the same place as Marlow he would never have survived. Another option was to use the third golden ticket when it was ready. It was another thing he wanted to put off till he was stronger, but it seemed that might take too long. Although there was no rush really, Lex could take all the time in the world, he didn't like being excessively lazy. After thinking for a while, he made up his mind. He was already experienced at going to another world, he would be better prepared this time around. It seemed like it was time to expand his customer base to another world. Chapter 54 Shopping 
Having made up his mind, Lex first checked up on his guests to see how they were doing. Hugo was still in his room, stabilizing his new realm. Marlo was still undergoing a process of healing and being corroded by his own blood, while Helen was almost completely cured. The only reason Helen hadn't been cured by now, in fact, was because she'd had the poison in her system so long it had seeped into her brain and affected it, healing which was a slow and delicate process. Still, she'd be out soon. Lex instructed Velma to stay by her side and to give her a tour once everything was done. With that he was done for now. He considered adding the guild room to the inn as well, it only cost 1000 MP, but he decided to wait till he had more guests frequenting his inn. There was no shortage of things he could buy, for example he could make Gerard and Velma permanent instead of keeping them on their temporary one-month lease, but he still had a few more weeks left for that. He was planning on making the change closer to their end date, that way he'd keep some MP in case of an emergency, failing that Marlow quest really affected him. He returned to his apartment and slept for a few hours before getting up at the break of dawn to go and exercise. He'd need to keep exerting himself if he wanted to speed up his body stabilization process. He strapped some weights onto his body and went out for a run. At around 9 a.m. he messaged Larry, asking him if he knew where he could quickly buy some gear. Larry replied with a location, asking Lex to meet him there in an hour. Unexpectedly, it was the Javits Center. A lot of large events took place there, and Lex had visited the place himself a few times during Comic Con. He really wasn't expecting such a public place to have anything to do with cultivators, it really took hiding in plain sight to another level. Lex showered and left immediately, quickly reaching his destination but arriving early was pointless as he still ended up waiting for Larry to arrive. When the exuberant young Larry arrived he looked much better than yesterday, with no sign of the many bruises he had earlier. Whether it was makeup or medicine that did the job, Lex could not tell at all. What kind of gear are you looking for? Larry asked after they greeted each other. Survival gear, body armor, weapons. I'll have to look at what's available, it really depends on what's available and what I can afford. Normally I'd ask Marlo, but he's away and God only knows when he'll be back. No no, it's a good thing you asked me instead. Not that Marlo wouldn't be able to help you out, but you really need to mix a little more with other cultivators. You need to be able to do things on your own in case you're ever in a pinch. Larry led the way, all the while telling Lex that he needed to expose himself more to the cultivation world and not be a recluse. When the two got in an elevator that led them deep into a basement Lex was not surprised at all, as he seemed to understand that this would be a continuing pattern in New York. When he exited the elevator he entered a large hall that looked identical to the one on the ground floor, and with the same AR technology used everywhere else it looked like they were out in the open instead of deep underground. Welcome to the main trading center for anything cultivator related in all of New York. Here, you can find anything from weapons to armor to med kits, spirit tech, cultivation techniques, spirit techniques to literally anything you can imagine as well as many things you can't imagine. The stalls are set up by individuals, organizations, companies, colleges, think tanks, basically anyone with anything to sell. And the security here is all maintained by Bluebird, and they're very thorough so you don't need to be afraid that you'll be robbed or ripped off. It might be slightly pricier than if you buy things from Marlow, but you'll get a whole lot more options as well. Lex was amazed by the giant underground market. Larry did not embellish at all, just from where he was standing he could see more variety in things for sale than he ever saw on the Bluebird portal. Listen, I'm sure you can handle yourself from here. I have a few chores I need to run myself, Larry spoke, less enthused than usual, but Lex didn't mind. Go ahead, thanks for bringing me here. I'll take my time looking at things so I might take a while anyway. And indeed, Lex spent quite a few hours there. At first he only looked through all the stalls. Contrary to what he expected, most things being sold had less to do with combat and cultivation and more to do with luxury or day-to-day -day convenience. Fashion was also something that was given a lot of importance, as a lot of apparel was being sold, with the added bonus that the clothes won't accidentally rip due to your increased strength. In the end, Lex could not help himself and bought himself a lot of sportswear as well as camouflaged armor for his legs as well as his upper body. He bought himself glasses that had automatic night vision as well as zoom, a backpack that could resist ripping from the strength of an average body cultivator, high-calorie rations, a wristwatch that would automatically create a map of anywhere he went when turned on, all-terrain boots, protective gloves and, unbelievably, deodorant for cultivators. It did not have a nice smell like other deodorants, but instead eliminated any and all smells on his body so that he could not be tracked. He bought various books on combat and survival, and for the cheap, Cheap price of $12 million he bought two generic cultivation techniques that went up to the peak of chi training. He wanted them for reference, so that he could understand how regular people cultivated and how it differed from regal embrace. 
Finally, he also bought a short sword and a dagger, both strengthened beyond regular cold weapons. He did not have to carry bags as he shopped as all the items would be delivered to his apartment within the day, so he explored the market freely. When he felt satisfied that he had seen everything that could be offered here, he sent Larry a message and left. Everything he bought was in preparation for his next adventure to a new world, it would only be a couple more days till the next golden ticket was available for use. Deep in a forest in Vegas Minima the sounds of battle echoed. A swift and merciless man cut through a small horde of zombies, using no weapons other than his bare hands. His trained body knew exactly how to move to avoid getting attacked, while giving him the vantage to attack as he pleased. In but a few minutes the horde was reduced to nothing but a pile of dead bodies and the man wasted no time in recovering the cores from their bodies. Just as he was removing the core from the last body, another man appeared behind, emitting an even stronger aura of bloodlust. Any signs? The first man asked, not bothering to look back. Nothing yet, the second man answered. If Lex saw them now he would be thoroughly surprised to find these two incredibly ferocious men were Brother Chen and Blaine, his two pro bono guests. The surprise would be because while they were at the end they behaved so meekly, but once they were back to their own world their true, battle-hardened selves were revealed. Blaine, who took out the last zombie core, frowned as he heard Brother Chen's words. When they returned from the inn they came back to the same place that they had made their final stand against the Tier 3 zombie. Finding their way back to the caravan should not have been a problem for them at all, especially since they were both good at tracking. However the caravan had mysteriously disappeared. No matter how they looked, they could not even find the caravan's trail let alone the caravan itself. Even if the caravan was destroyed by zombies there should have been some signs of battle. Yet there was nothing. It was as if they were teleported, much in the same way the two soldiers had been teleported to the inn. Rest up. Come Don, we'll continue our search. This time, we'll try to be quiet and avoid fighting, it wastes too much time. If we're unable to find the caravan in the next few days, I think we should return to the inn and see if they have something that can help us. Blaine only nodded, grimacing. I hope you're okay Iris, he thought. You have to be. Chapter 55, Tom. The next day during Lex's early morning workout Mary informed him that Helen had been completely healed. However, since she had woken up she had not spoken with anyone and had asked to be left alone. She had been sitting in the lawn behind the inn, looking forlorn and lost in thought. Since she wanted to be left alone Lex did not disturb her, but instructed Mary to have a Saturn cake sent to her when she was feeling better. Lex did not know if there were other things on her mind, but coming so close to death would definitely traumatize anyone. Although he'd be paying for the cake himself, he considered it a little gift to Alexander for all his spending, not to mention it would give him a good idea of how effective the Saturn cake was at making the eater feel euphoric. With that he put her out of his thoughts and continued his training. He also tried to look up other information about what happened in Egypt, but there were only rumors online. He also finally met up with Elaine and Harry, his friends from his previous job. Giving as little detail as possible he filled them in on his new job and asked them how things were going at their old place. He was particularly interested in what Jessica, his old boss, was up to but his friends mistook his interest as romantic. Elaine and Harry shared a secret look, but Lex missed it and was thus completely unaware that his friends had started considering how to get Lex and Jessica together for a romantic rendezvous. Lex also finally got around to having a video call with his family, taking particular care in letting them know that New York was not a place they'd be interested in visiting and should not consider doing so. His youngest sister, Moon, was behaving especially suspicious during the call but Lex couldn't be bothered to investigate. Lex was basically checking all the chores he had been avoiding off his list before his travel to the New World. Last time he had been fortunate enough that he returned within a day, but there was no guarantee of such a thing happening again. Finally, after all his waiting, he received a system notification. Host can now use the golden ticket. Without hesitation he summoned the ticket and tore it in half. The two pieces disappeared in a shining light and a panel appeared before his eyes. Planets available. Planet, Nibiru. Planet rating, 1 star. Planet distance, 3 sectors. Planet environment, extremely vibrant. Planet, Dunya. Planet rating, 5 stars. Planet distance, 8 sectors. Planet environment, extremely dense spiritual energy. These were the only two planets available this time around, but before Lex could get a good read on he received another notification. New quest, host has encountered a planet extremely suitable for finding guests. Build a connection to Dunya. Quest time limit, none. Quest reward, one free and upgrade. Remarks, please wash your face before going to Dunya. The system will be embarrassed if it is associated with a dirty-looking fellow. Lex's lips twitched, and he felt like beating someone up. He had been waiting for a quest, 
but it was a good thing that this quest had no time limit as there was no way he'd be going to a five-star world with his current cultivation. A one-star world had almost killed him. This would be something for the future. Without wasting any further time he selected Nibiru and disappeared. Lex was extremely tense when he reappeared, and quickly analyzed his surroundings for any threats. Fortunately, his arrival this time was different from last. He found himself standing alone in the middle of a wide, dirt road on a plateau. It seemed like early morning, and the pleasant weather and cool breeze welcomed Lex like a fond friend. Some distance on his left there seemed to be a forest, but on his right down the plateau Lex could see some farmers working in what looked like rice fields. Lex relaxed a little, and moved his hand away from the heavy Harley that he was wearing on his hip. The short sword that he had recently bought was strapped to his back, and his dagger in his boot. He was wearing his defensive, camouflage gear as well as his new backpack so he stood out like a nail in this very rural environment, but he was more concerned with his immediate security rather than attracting attention. Making sure that nothing was amiss, he sent the bathroom slipper back into the system inventory. But since he was wearing boots, how was he also wearing the slippers? Well Lex had realized that he didn't really need to be wearing the slippers on his feet for them to have an effect, only have them on his body. So he used a spare lace he had in his apartment and tied both ends onto one slipper each, then hung the slippers around his neck. It looked hideous but it was more practical. Not to mention no one saw it so it didn't really matter. Just as he was about to move, he heard rustling from the forest and looked just in time to see a ruffled young man running out of the forest, completely out of breath. The young man was wearing what looked like scholar's robes, something very unfit for running, and had numerous scratches on his somewhat dirty face. Glee could be seen on his face when he exited the forest, and scurried towards the road. Yet when the boy noticed Lex on the road he froze, gripped with shock and horror. The both of them stood facing one another a few feet apart, analyzing the other. Lex was dressed too peculiarly, and judging by the other face he could tell that all sorts of assumptions were being made about him. It would be better to take control of the situation before something unexpected happened. Hello there friend, Lex spoke warmly with a smile, my name is Lex. I seem to have gotten lost. Could you point me towards the nearest town or village? I would appreciate it. The young man gathered himself up when he heard Lex speak. The fear on his face disappeared, but suspicion clearly painted his face. Clearly whatever he had originally assumed about Lex was wrong, but he could not judge the truthfulness of his words. My name is Tiff, no, Tom. You can call me Tom, he said. Or rather, she said. The moment she spoke Lex could tell it was a girl, her voice a clear giveaway. She had disguised herself well, not to mention her short hair and dirty face adding to it. But once Lex realized, it became obvious that this wasn't really a boy. You'll only find farmers here. The nearest village is two days away by a donkey cart. You only need to follow the road. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to be leaving. Tom fixed up her robes and started strutting down the road as if she had nothing to hide, though her unusually quick pace spoke otherwise. Are you alright, Tom? Do you need any help? Lex asked, amused. No, I mean yes, I am completely all right. I am very, very all right. I don't need any help. I completely do not need help at all, just as Tom was speaking, for men dressed completely in black broke out of the forest in a fury. They were holding daggers in their hands, and as soon as they saw Tom and Lex they yelled and attacked. Before Tom could react Lex picked her up and started running, a grin on his face. Tom, taken by surprise, yelled, but quickly stopped when she heard Lex say, Are you sure you're totally completely all right? You don't even need a little help? The four pursuers were mortals and thus would not be able to keep up with Lex's pace, so he felt no pressure at all. He could have also fought them, but he didn't want to fight, and potentially kill, random people for no reason at all. More importantly, Tom's bad acting and disheveled appearance filled Lex with the urge to tease her. But most importantly, he received another notification from the system. New quest, you have encountered someone carrying the will of the world Nibiru. Protect their safety and help them complete their task to gain goodwill from Nibiru. Quest reward, depends on time taken to complete. The quicker the completion, the better the reward. Quest failure punishment, drastic drop of luck whilst in Nibiru. Dash 1000 MP, if the host is unable to pay, it will result in immediate death. Chapter 56 Red Nation Although he was being chased, Lex felt no pressure at all as his physique had improved immensely. Even when carrying the girl in his arms he felt at ease. You're, you're kidnapping me, stammered Tom with a flustered expression. Oh? Should I put you down then, he asked, smirking. Tom leaned over to look behind Lex's shoulder and saw their pursuers. Although they had started lagging behind, they were very much still in their view. Kidnap me faster, Tom said finally, deciding that the men in black were scarier. Lex let out an amused laugh and picked up his pace. For some reason he found this young girl to be very adorable and instinctually wanted to help her. 
Only a few minutes later the men in black had stopped chasing as they were completely out of breath, and Lex had left them far behind. Run into the field, Tom said. I know a good place. Lex listened to the girl's instructions and followed where she directed. Soon he found himself in the wild, far away from any indication of civilization. Ultimately they stopped by a small creek with a hidden tunnel and that began from the base of the tree. Tom, climbing out of Lex's embrace, led Lex into the tunnel before covering the entrance with a wooden board. The tunnel was not dark however, as luminescent flora lined the walls. Eventually the tunnel opened up to a small yet cozy room with a few chairs, a cot, a table and a lot of books. Tom sat herself down on one of the chairs before she started breathing raggedly, as if she had been the one running. Then she did an action to indicate she was wiping the sweat off her brow, before turning to look at Lex. You are welcome, she said, her voice loud and magnanimous. If I hadn't told you where to go you would have probably kept on running on the road and then the bad guys would have caught you. Lex's lips twitched. It seemed he had a knack for finding unusual people. Thank you, but I get the feeling they were more interested in you than in me. As soon as he said that Tom's face grimaced, her hands clenched into fists. Do you need any help? Lex found himself asking. Those bad men want to hurt the Lord Protector. Father Henry found out about them, but before he could tell anyone they came to hurt him. He wrote a letter and told me to take it to the capital, but before I could do anything those bad guys started chasing after me. If I don't take the letter to the capital soon, they might end up hurting Lord Protector. In that case, let me take you to the capital. We shouldn't waste time sitting around here, we should be moving. Lex needed to help the girl with her task for his quest not to mention she seemed very upfront so would be a great source of information about this world. Tom hesitated. Why do you want to help me? If you stay with me, those bad guys will come after you as well. Of course, it's for the Lord Protector. Lex boldly claimed, having no idea who he was talking about at all. How can I relax when I know someone wants to hurt the Lord Protector? Not to mention, I also need to go to the capital, and as I told you already, I'm kinda lost. Tom was hesitating, deciding whether she could trust Lex, until she finally decided that if he wanted to hurt her he could have done it already. Okay, then we should go. But I need to rest a little first, I've been running all night. By the way, my name is Tiffany. I'm sorry I lied to you, I thought you were also a bad man. Haha <laughs> I can't blame you. I am dressed a little strangely, anyone would be afraid. But these clothes are really good for traveling, which is why I'm wearing them. After that little exchange Tiffany let her guard down, and Lex began asking her random questions to try and understand the world a little bit. He could not ask directly, but fortunately Tiffany did not think his questions were strange and answered him honestly. First of all, he was in a country called Red Nation. Tiffany didn't know much about the world, but Red Nation shared a border with at least three other countries. Civilization on this planet seemed to be developed at the level of the Middle Ages on Earth, but there was one very prominent difference between Nibiru and Earth. Humans were one of the lowest on the food chain on this planet. This world was ruled by beasts, and humans did not seem to have any knowledge of cultivation at all. The countries weren't dictated according to the will of the people, but according to the territory of the beast Alpha that occupied the lands. How the people of each country were treated was completely up to the will of the beast Alpha, however it seemed the consensus was that humans made very good workers and soldiers. The people in Red Nation were treated relatively extremely well, but in some of the neighboring countries humans were completely treated as slaves. This information was extremely shocking to Lex, and it left him with a strange bitter aftertaste in his mouth. All the humans on this entire planet, or at least in the nearby countries, lived at the mercy of beasts. Of the three worlds Lex had been on, he now realized how blessed he was that Earth was where he lived. To distract himself he asked Tiffany a little more about herself. She was 13 years old, almost 14 now, and was raised by the priest she called Father Henry. Father Henry and his colleagues worked directly for the Lord Protector, and were given tasks that helped keep their country vibrant. After asking a few more questions, Lex came to the conclusion that the Lord Protector of Red Nation might not actually be a beast, but some kind of spirit plant that had gained sentience. That was because all the priests of Red Nation were tasked with taking care of all the flora of the country, and often performed rituals that involved taking care of forests. From starting controlled fires, eliminating pests, spreading fertilizers, collecting or spreading seeds to many more tasks that Lex could not understand all their actions had something to do with plants. Fortunately for him, he also learned that humans were a protected class in Red Nation, which meant that as long as he stuck close to the roads he would not come under attack from spirit beasts. If they strayed too far into the wild, however, then their survival was in their own hands. As a mere body tempering cultivator, Lex decided that even if had to risk running into those pursuers, he would promptly return to the main road once they left. Eventually, after all that talking, Tiffany became drowsy and lay down for a nap. 
As soon as she woke up, they would leave and begin their new adventure. Chapter 57 Idea While Tiffany slept, Lex went through the books in the small room. Most of them were children's stories about heroic and magnanimous beasts helping and guiding the humans to safety. Others were on random subjects such as herbology or carpentry, to biographies of some beast alphas who had a great influence on humans, both for the better and worse. Naturally, Lex used the books as a database to feed his fancy monocle with some knowledge of this world. Furthermore, while a lot of the stories were surely fictional, Lex was able to piece out the history of this world, at least in regards to humans. They truly were at the lowest step of the food chain, living like nomads in the most desolate places to avoid wild beasts. At some point in history a few tribes either tried to domesticate, or rescued young beasts and raised them as a part of the tribe. The exact details could only be guessed, but the basic story was that the first time humans came out of hiding was when a beast alpha was born that considered itself a part of a human tribe. It gave them territory and protected them, and allowed them to grow and prosper. Under their newfound protection, humans thrived and prospered, and slowly started coming out of the Stone Age. They created villages and communities, and as their knowledge grew what they developed a symbiotic relationship with the beasts that protected them. Their study of different environments as well as farming and medicine allowed them to aid the cultivation of not only the beast alphas, but beasts of all cultivation stages. Slowly other alphas also learned of the benefits of letting humans manage their territories, and thus humans went from being an almost extinct species on this planet to coveted workers. Of course each alpha had a different way of using humans, but the trend had been established. This same trend had been going on for thousands and thousands of years, and the positions of humans had been cemented at the bottom. Occasionally some lucky humans would encounter some spiritual fruits of treasures that would enhance and strengthen their bodies, making them stronger than mortals, but not only was such progress inconsistent and irreplicable, the benefit was not strong enough to give humans independent territory of their own. All these details were simply what Lex had surmised from reading the various books, and could be wrong. He would have to investigate more to find out. And speaking of investigating? Hey Tiffany, wake up, Lex said as he woke up the young girl. It had been a couple of hours, and though he had no doubt that she could sleep more, he didn't want to waste any more time. The quicker he helped her complete her task, the better his reward would be. And who knew how long it would take to get to the capital? Not to mention he doubted her pursuers would give up so easily. Waking up the young girl was an ordeal of its own, but he finally managed to do it by telling her the longer they took the more danger the Lord Protector would be in. Then came an issue that Lex did not anticipate. The capital was likely far away so he asked if there was a place where they could get horses. That was where the issue came in, no one on this planet could conceive a human riding an animal or a beast. Even if it were a normal animal and not a spirit beast, riding atop it would antagonize any beast that saw it. Hunting for food was acceptable, enslaving or using for domestic purposes was not. That meant he would have to run all the way to the village, from where he could trade for a cycle. After some effort Lex convinced Tiffany to climb onto his back as he would be faster and departed at a light jog. Tiffany tried to guide him through the wild, insisting that she knew this place well enough to avoid any danger but Lex ignored her and directly returned towards the dirt road. Hey wait, head that way, Tiffany said excitedly from Lex's shortly after they left. They head towards a tree with its bark covered in some kind of vine. Not waiting to explain, Tiffany reached out and grabbed one of the vines, ripped one of the leaves in half and rubbed the sap all over her hands. You try it as well, she said, sniffing her hands with a smile. Lex, curious as to her intentions, did the same. When he rubbed the sap from the leaf on his hands he felt a cooling sensation entering his body from his hands, relaxing him. In a few moments he was completely refreshed, and the slight fatigue he had accumulated completely disappeared. Smell your hands, Tiffany said, still doing the same. Lex raised his hands expectantly and was welcomed by a pleasant aroma. It smelled similar to night jasmine but more than the aroma Lex was enthralled by the cooling sensation he felt entering his brain. It lasted only a few seconds, but he was hooked. What is that? Lex asked, breaking another leaf and squeezing the sap into his hands. I call it Tiffany's treasure, although I don't know what other people call it. I love the smell and it feels so good, and look, it's so good for the skin. She showed him her hand where she previously had a scratch from last night, however the sap was visibly healing her hand. In a few minutes, there would be no trace of the wound having ever existed. Watching her hand as if he was watching a miracle, Lex suddenly had an idea. Do you know what the seed for Tiffany's treasure looks like? The young girl nodded, completely ignoring the fact that she was on his back and Lex could not see her. But at the moment, neither of them cared. They both were distracted by their own ideas. In a dark room a large, brown fox lay comfortably on an equally large pillow. There were no torches in the room, and the few windows had curtains drawn in front of them. 
There was no other furniture or other decoration in the room, as if the fox was supposed to be the only and main attraction. The silence was broken, however, by the sound of an opening door followed by a man dressed in black entering and sitting on his knees before the large fox. My lord, there's a report from the Eastern Temple in the Red Nation. All the priests have been captured, but a human child witnessed the event and escaped. So far we have been unable to capture the child. The fox lazily opened a single eye and looked at the man in front of her, before saying, Tell me, are human children traditionally faster than the adults? They must be, otherwise why would none of your people be unable to capture the child? No my lord. The child was just lucky. My men chased after the child, but in the darkness they were slowed down in the forest. A couple times they almost caught the child, but they happened to run into wild beasts and had to fend them off. In the end the child ran into another human who we believe has taken a strengthening fruit. They were able to run away faster than my men could keep up. Fortunately the man did not know how to hide his tracks. My men are chasing after them as we speak. I believe in a few hours, both the child and man will be captured. The fox looked at the desperate face the man before her was making, and thought for a few moments. Finally she said, send word to the brown bari wolf pack. Tell them I want the entire pack after the two humans. Also send word back to the Iron Mountains, tell them moving forward they should assume that details of our actions in Red Nation have been leaked. Speed up the infiltration, and don't hesitate to use drastic measures if necessary. But my lord, the man cried out, gripped in fear, we can capture the two humans. We can. We won't let the news leak. Even if you capture them now, there's no guarantee that they haven't spread the news already, or sent some kind of message. Since you lost sight of them, assume the news has already disseminated. Do not try to cover up your failures, and do not be afraid to make changes to the plan. Now go, I want to continue napping. The man's entire body trembled as he accepted his orders, and left the room to carry out his orders. Compared to other spirit beasts, this fox was very calm and didn't bother with unnecessary details. But once news of his failure made its way back to the Iron Mountains, there was no way he would escape punishment, and in the Iron Mountains the lightest punishment for humans was death. Chapter 58 Trouble it had been a few hours since they left and despite slowing down occasionally to collect seeds or roots of some plants Lex thought had interesting uses, the duo had made good progress. Lex was traveling at a light jog so as to not exhaust his stamina, but speed up their journey. In fact, they were already in sight of a town from where Lex would be able to purchase a bicycle. As for how to make the payment, Lex was embarrassed to admit that he would have to borrow money from Tiffany, as he had no idea what kind of currency worked in this world. Fortunately the little girl had already assured him that she would be able to buy it. The town was very different from what Lex was expecting. Most noticeably, it was extremely clean which was a great feat considering their limited technology. Even a lot of Manhattan wasn't as clean as this town appeared to be. There was no trash anywhere on the ground, the roads and streets were made of stone and the buildings made out of what looked like extremely large bricks. But despite the apparent urbanization of the area, nature was also dominant in the city, with fruit trees every dozen or so feet and neat trimmed gardens right beside the roads. The people were all dressed in cotton tunics and dresses, and moved about their way normally. If Lex didn't see the occasional giant beast strolling the streets he could practically mistake it for Earth. Still, as fascinating as it was, Lex didn't want to waste time admiring the town. The two found their way to the market and bought themselves a cycle. When it was time for payment, instead of paying Tiffany took out a medallion with the words Eastern Temple written on it. The man was incomparably excited when he saw the medallion, and replaced the cycle Lex had gotten with the best one he sold for no cost at all. Lex wanted to depart immediately but Tiffany insisted that they stop to eat. Lex tried to insist, but who could win an argument against someone so young? They entered what could be considered a lavish restaurant and ordered a vegetable soup and some fruit. Based on what Lex saw everyone was eating vegetables or fruit, with no meat to be seen anywhere. It made sense, with no domestication a stable meat source would be incredibly difficult to find. The two ate while chatting, ignoring all the strange looks Lex's attire was attracting as they had anticipated it. So does the token from the temple let you buy whatever you want? Of course. The temple enacts the will of the Lord Protector, and everything in Red Nation naturally belongs to the Lord Protector. So it is not that I am not paying them, but rather they are just returning to me the property of the Lord Protector. But of course, I can't use the token to just take whatever I want. In the first place, it's not even mine, it's Father Henry's. Tiffany seemed completely fine talking about the priest Father Henry, which Lex thought was slightly unusual. He was the man that raised Tiffany and had been captured by unknown people, shouldn't she be more concerned? Speaking of Father Henry, do you know why those people went after him? Even if they want to hurt the Lord Protector, I can't imagine some humans being able to hurt him. I don't know, she said, taking a bite out of what looked like a purple apple. 
but they must be working for some other beast. But even so, they can't hurt Father Henry. He's been marked by the Lord Protector, if he dies then the Lord Protector will know immediately. That explained why she was so relaxed. Anyway, do you know the way to the capital? Or how long it will take to get there? We need to plan our travel time accordingly. Actually, we don't really need to go all the way to the capital. That would take almost a month, or even more. We just need to travel to the power city, which is just a few days away. From there we can have the letter sent to the temple in the capital directly. And do you know the way to power city? Naturally, I know everything, she said, with pride painted on her face. If she didn't have bits of fruit stuck right above her lips it might have even seemed impressive. Then let's stop wasting time, Lex said getting up. The longer we delay, the greater there is a chance of something going wrong. We should hurry up. Tiffany, the little glutton, seemed reluctant to leave the restaurant but ultimately followed Lex. Lex got on the cycle and Tiffany climbed on the small, extra seat attached behind and they finally departed. The road once outside the town was once again a dirt road, but Lex was impressed by the fact that it was leveled and uniform all the way, with no bumps or potholes. He wondered who maintained the roads, but it was just a passing thought. There were no signs anywhere but Tiffany gave him directions whenever they were needed, and truly did seem to know where they were going. Lex maintained an even pace so that he would not get tired, but they were already much faster than when he was jogging. After a few hours they stopped encountering farms and the scenery was filled with verdant hills that were slowly becoming smaller. In the distance Lex could see a forest that seemed to reach out into the horizon. This place really did have a lot of vegetation, which made him more sure of his conjecture that the beast alpha of this country was not actually a beast but a spirit plant. He wondered if he could get a seed or a cutting. Suddenly Lex felt goosebumps all over his body and his body stiffened, as if sensing danger. He looked around to locate the source of his unease, but did not need to look for long. Some distance behind them Lex saw a lone, brown-colored wolf standing in the middle or the road staring at them. The distance made it hard to tell but Lex felt like the wolf was at least five feet in height, which would make it the largest canine he had ever seen. Tiffany noticed him staring at the wolf and tried to reassure him, don't worry. As long as we're on the road no beast will attack humans, not to mention I have the token of the temple. It will be able to sense the aura of the Lord Protector on it and, before Tiffany could finish the wolf looked up into the sky and let out a loud, savage howl. A tide of wolves emerged from the trees behind it and surged towards the duo. Hold on. Lex roared, and started cycling at full speed. Tiffany was extremely frightened and was hugging his back tightly. Lex also felt fear, but he also felt excitement and exhilaration. Last time with the zombies he was caught unprepared, but this time he was ready for trouble. Chapter 59 Zombie Slayer Returns Lex was cycling as fast as he could, but he knew that he would not be able to match the stamina of an entire wolf pack. Eventually they would catch up. Fitting the fancy monocle in his eye he turned around once more to take a look at his assailants. A single glance was all it took for the monocle to record all the data he needed. The giant wolf, which Lex assumed was the leader of the pack, was at spiritual awakening while the rest were normal wolves. Spiritual awakening was the level that animals entered when they became spiritual beasts, and was equivalent to a human chi training. The fact that the rest of the pack consisted of normal wolves did not make Lex's life any easier either, as their numbers continued to increase. So far 60 wolves were already chasing after him, with the leader of the pack still standing in the back. Various thoughts raced through Lex's mind as he decided the best course of action. The most obvious option was to take out his gun and shoot, but the recoil on that was too strong and would probably knock him off his cycle. He could use his short sword to attack them if they get close, but if they overwhelmed him with numbers he wasn't sure about being able to protect himself let alone Tiffany. A few other thoughts ran through his mind before he looked up at the sky. The sun was getting low, but it was still about an hour away from dusk. Tiffany, do you know any good places we can hide? Or get a vantage against the wolves, he asked, but the young girl was frozen in fear and she was not able to answer. Lex shook his head and swiftly made a plan. He reached a hand into his backpack and rummaged around till he found two small cylindrical items. When he pulled them out they looked like shotgun shells, but they served a different purpose. He cracked one and thick gray smoke started pouring out, completely covering the road behind them. This was a compact smokescreen maker that he had bought. The smoke not only affected visibility, it would sting the eyes, nose and throat of anyone in the smoke. Lex was not sure how strong the effect would be on these wolves, but he was certain it would at least slow them down and affect their senses. Waiting till night was a very important part of his plan and he had to delay things as much as he could. Tiffany, hold this, Lex said as he handed her the smokescreen maker. He had to repeat himself a few times but the young girl eventually obeyed and held onto it tightly. Slowly, she was coming out of her initial shock and although she was still afraid she was no longer frozen. 
Tell me when the smoke stops coming out, he instructed and put his hand back into his bag. Some more rummaging and he took out what looked like an injection. Wasting no time he stabbed himself in the arm and squeezed the injection. This was a booster that would act like adrenaline, boosting his speed and giving him energy, and it simultaneously relieved the fatigue his muscles built up. With that done he turned his attention to cycling, and sped up even further. After a few minutes the smokescreen maker stopped working, but Lex didn't immediately use the second one. He only had two and he had to use them effectively. The wolves had slowed down and the distance between them had increased. The pursuit continued like that for another twenty minutes before the wolves seemed to have recovered from the effects of the smokescreen and sped up their chase. He waited till they came closer and used the second smokescreen as well. This was nothing more than a delaying tactic, as he would not be able to go far enough to completely escape them no matter what he did. Besides, running away was never his plan to begin with. The second smokescreen bought him some time, as the wolves seemed to be affected even worse the second time. They were also hesitant in coming near him, and Lex was sure that if it weren't for the orders of the leader of the pack they would have stopped chasing after him. Speaking of the leader, it seemed completely unaffected by the smoke, but did not venture away from the pack to hunt Lex alone. That was quite fortunate as Lex would have to risk using his gun if the large wolf chased. The sun eventually set, and fortunately it set earlier than Lex had expected. He put on his night vision goggles and, to Tiffany's dismay, veered off the road and directly into the forest. His cycle was already the best in the shop that he had gotten it from, but he doubted it would last long with such rough use. Cycling on no clear path, over tough tree roots and various jagged rocks he expected at least the tires would give out soon. He reached into his bag one more time and took out a flashbang, pressed a red button and dropped it on the floor. It had a ten-second delay, which should be enough to blind the wolves immediately behind him and give him some time. Not slowing down at all he made his way through the increasingly dark forest. Tiffany, listen to me, he said, once again reaching into his bag. I'm going to hide you and attract the wolves. Wait till they're out of sight and run away. What? No, the young girl exclaimed in fear and shock. There's no choice. We can't risk you getting caught. Listen to me, I'll be fine. But you need to run. For the Lord Protector, you have to be safe. Lex's words seemed to resonate with the girl, but she had gone completely pale and bit her in anxiousness and frustration. Tears welled up in her eyes but she did her best to keep them from falling. Finally Lex pulled his hand out of his bag with his special deodorant. He sprayed Tiffany from top to bottom, making sure to eliminate any and all smell on her. Get ready, he said when he heard the flashbang go off in the distance. He stopped for only a moment, grabbed the girl with a single hand and lurched her high up onto a branch of a very tall tree. That should keep her out of sight, and with no smell they wolves shouldn't be able to track her. But still despite that, he didn't want to risk going too far. He cycled just a little bit further and waited till the wolves were in sight. He needed to ensure that they kept pursuing him. He only needed to wait a few more seconds till they came in view. Hey you filthy mutts, he roared as he started cycling away again. Do you think I'm easy prey? Keep chasing after me if you have the guts. We'll see who hunts who. Lex kept yelling as he cycled away. Coming closer to the inevitable confrontation Lex was filled with nervousness, but also excitement. Lex the zombie slayer was about to try his hand on slaying some wolves. Tiffany was hugging the trunk of the tree, having covered her body in some leaves she had broken off the branches. In the dark it was already hard to see, but there was no harm in trying to camouflage herself some more. When the first wolf crossed from near the tree she almost let out a startled cry, but she was able to control herself. After that the wolves kept passing her by, and as she saw their vast numbers fear gripped her. She knew Lex said that he would be fine, but she was not an idiot. She did not believe he could survive all these wolves attacking him. She closed her eyes and tried to distract her thoughts. For the Lord Protector, she had to survive. She couldn't let Lex's sacrifice be in vain. After a few minutes peace returned to the forest around her. No more wolves had run past her tree for a while now, and she could no longer even hear Lex's yelling and taunting. As much as she wanted to stay in the tree and continue hiding, she knew she had to move. She stopped hugging the tree and dropped all the leaves attached to her body, ready to climb down, but when she turned her body froze. Right in front of her, a giant sparrow sat in the tree, staring directly at her. Tiffany gulped as she tried to stop her body from trembling. Chapter 61 Abi Tarzan As Lex made his way through the forest, he could feel the condition of his cycle deteriorating. The tire's frame was losing shape and was becoming bumpy. After a few more minutes he eventually gave up on the cycle and started running. Now he was really in the thick of things. He was not afraid of fighting a few wolves, but there really were too many after him for him to make a stand. He had to fight them off while he kept running. He held his short sword in his right hand and the heavy Harley in his left hand. 
When he was cycling on the road he had managed to pull quite a distance, but in the forest and on foot it wouldn't be long now till they caught up to him. His aim wasn't that good yet, not to mention with his left hand, but since he would be fighting in close range he would manage. As Lex jumped over a fallen tree he entered a clearing. Just as he was planning how to engage he felt goosebumps on his back and leaped to his side without any delay. A wolf had pounced on him, but barely missed him. He aimed the Harley at the wolf and without hesitation shot at its body. The wolf was hit, but was only wounded. Lex got up, ready to stab the downed wolf but three more wolves jumped at him from the trees. He dodged to the side but swung his short sword at the nearest wolf while shooting at the one immediately behind it. The sword slashed at the wolf's face but because he had swung without any form or force it only cut the wolf and didn't kill it, while his shot missed entirely but at least deterred the chasing wolf. The wolves stopped attacking, and started arranging themselves in a formation to surround him but Lex had no intention of waiting. Lex lunged towards the wolf he had shot earlier and stabbed his short sword towards its face. The wolf tried to dodge but its injury prevented it from moving quickly and Lex's sword found its way into its neck. The first wolf collapsed but before he could do anything else the other three wolves attacked from behind. Lex, who had spent some time preparing for fights using some of the most knowledge-rich video games ever, knew exactly what to do, the Dark Souls role. Coming out of the role Lex quickly took aim behind him and shot a few rounds at the wolves before they could reach him. He was embarrassed to discover that even at such a close range he missed some of his shots, the recoil was nothing to scoff at. Fortunately he hit enough shots, and he wounded the wolves enough that he was easily able to stab them to death. The small engagement left Lex out of breath, but in actuality it had not even been an entire minute long. You should have given up on the quest, said Mary who had appeared in the air in front of him. She wore a worried look as she looked deep into the forest. There's no way you can handle so many wolves. As long as I keep moving and pick them off a few at a time, I'll be fine. Lex didn't wait for the rest of the wolves, he turned and started running deeper into the forest. Truth be told, logically it seemed impossible for Lex to survive this but he had a gut feeling that he could. It was as if his instincts were driving his actions, leading him onto the path that would help him survive. Mary, if I make any mistakes then let me know. The gun has 93 bullets left, when they run out remind me to refill the magazine. I have a few spirit tokens in my bag. If you see any wolves sneaking up from behind when I'm in a fight, warn me. You should also keep an eye out for other beasts, Mary warned, sitting on his head as he ran. Such a commotion is bound to attract attention. Lex took her advice in his stride as he ran. His biggest concern was the darkness. He could only see because of his night vision glasses but he had confirmed using the fancy monocle that the wolves could see just fine, or at least better than he naturally could in the dark. He could not afford to damage his glasses. He heard the sounds of his pursuers and he glanced back to see two more wolves closing in on him. He turned towards the wolves and put his back against a tree so nothing would sneak up on him from behind. He aimed the heavy Harley, making sure his stance was correct, before shooting at the nearest wolf. He didn't know if he was lucky or his aim was good when he actually took his time, but he shot the wolf in the head, instantly killing it. Aware that he didn't have the time to aim properly again, he launched himself towards the second wolf and stabbed at it, making sure to not get hit in return. He managed to stab it above its right leg, crippling its movement. I do more damage with stabs than slashes, he had a passing thought. But he had no time to waste on contemplation. With the wolf injured and unable to give chase, Lex left, not bothering to finish the kill. Every second was important to him right now, he had to make the correct decision at every turn. He had to stay ahead of the pack. The young man ran aimlessly through the woods, completely lost, but behind him he left a trail of dead or wounded wolves. With each encounter he became more familiar with how the wolves attacked, with each encounter he learned the limits of his ability, with each encounter he became more deadly. Given his untrained and amateur state, were anyone to see him they would be taken aback by the fact that he had yet to be hit even a single time by the wolves so far. His aim with the gun improved, and after a while he began adjusting for the recoil instinctively. Eventually he reached the point where he became better with the gun in his left hand than he was in the right. Like on Vegas Minima, his actions became seamless and his body knew exactly how to move. At a certain point he ran into wolves, but this time they were coming at him from the front as well as from behind him. They must have surrounded him, but he was completely unaware. Without a moment's hesitation, as if that had been his plan all along, he holstered his weapons and climbed up a tree with the speed and efficiency of a monkey. But that was not an escape, the wolves would find a way to reach him, so he leaped from the branch of one tree to the next. But how could running in a forest be so easy? He leaped onto the latest tree branch, ready to keep moving, but instead of the firm bark of a tree his foot handed on something squishy, causing him to lose his footing and fall out of the tree. Panicking a little, he raced to get up, the wolves were right behind him, 
but his thoughts were interrupted by a loud and angry screech. He looked up to see a barrel of angry monkeys, jumping up and down ready to attack. Before a complete idea could even form in his mind, Lex was racing away from the tree and towards the wolves. He shot the Harley a few times at the wolves, injuring them and causing them to stumble, before he ran right through the small pack. From the howling and screeching behind him Lex was sure the two groups of animals had started fighting. He smirked, and looked back once to ensure that they were indeed fighting and not chasing him together, before continuing his escape. It was at this moment, when a small amount of pride and confidence were beginning to fill Lex's heart, when he saw the largest wolf, the Alpha, standing right in his path with a dozen or so wolves behind it. Bloody hell, he exclaimed as he started shooting the Harley as quickly as he could manage.